Plane disappearances have to be one of the creepiest types of cases. The fact that there have been huge aircrafts full of people that have seemingly vanished into thin air is incredibly unsettling, and it really makes you wonder if that next trip overseas is worth it. We're going to start off with Flying Tiger Line Flight 739. Flying Tiger Line Flight 739 was a Lockheed L-1049 Super Constellation aircraft that seemed to vanish on March 16th of 1962. The flight left from California was en route to its final destination in Saigon. The plane was carrying 96 military passengers, but at some point during the flight it lost contact and disappeared from radar screens somewhere over the western Pacific Ocean. There was no wreckage or debris ever found. One possibility is that the plane exploded in midair, but without any remnants of the plane to look at, it's not clear exactly what would have caused that to happen. There's also the possibility that the aircraft deviated from its flight path because of some navigational error and then crashed in an area not covered in the search. There were also no distress calls to go off of, so to this day, the cause of the disappearance is still unknown. Next up on the list is Varig Flight 967. Varig Flight 967 was a commercial flight that mysteriously disappeared on January 30th of 1979 while en route from Tokyo to Rio de Janeiro. The plane was a Boeing 707-323C operated by the Brazilian airline Varig. It was mostly carrying cargo, $1.24 million worth of paintings by the Japanese Brazilian painter Manobu Mabe. The flight had a scheduled layover in Los Angeles where it was going to pick up additional cargo and passengers, but it never landed in LA. There was a sudden loss of communication with air traffic control. Around eight hours into the flight, the crew failed to establish radio contact during routine check-ins. No distress signals or emergency calls were ever received either. The aircraft just went silent. Finding this plane was like searching for a needle in a haystack. It went down somewhere in the vast Pacific Ocean. Search operations were carried out by both Brazilian and American authorities, but the wreckage of the flight was never found and no signs of the cargo or six crew members ever been found either. Canadian Pacific Airlines Flight 3505. On July 21st of 1951, during a scheduled flight from Vancouver, Canada to Tokyo, the plane disappeared without a trace. The flight was carrying 31 passengers and six crew members. It left Vancouver International Airport at 635 with a planned stopover at Anchorage Airport in Alaska. The aircraft was on schedule, reporting its position at the Cape Spencer intersection in British Columbia, 90 minutes away from Anchorage, but the weather conditions in the area were apparently challenging. Heavy rain and icing and visibility was low. Fortunately, after the last reported position, the plane went silent. The search efforts were eventually called off on October 31st of 1951. Six member crew were all Canadians, while the 31 passengers included two Royal Canadian Navy sailors, 26 United States military members, and three civilian U.S. citizens. But unfortunately, none of these passengers have have ever been found. Next up, we have the Indian Air Force AN-32. In January of 2016, an Antonov AN-32 aircraft of the Indian Air Force had gone missing during a flight from Chennai to Port Blair in the Bay of Bengal. The flight, carrying 29 people on board, including six crew and 23 passengers, lost contact with air traffic control about 16 minutes after taking off. And of course, the plane never reached its destination. There was a widespread search and rescue operation Operation. And after months of relentless efforts by Indian authorities with naval vessels, aircrafts, and satellite imagery to scour the Bay of Bengal, nothing turned up. The search covered extensive areas too, both on the surface of the water and beneath it. For a long time, it was assumed the wreckage would never be found. Just another mysterious plane disappearance. But just recently, in January of this year, which at the time of recording this is 2024, the wreckage of the aircraft was finally discovered off the coast of Chennai. Fortunately, there were no survivors, unsurprisingly. Next on the list, we have Glenn Miller. So this is a famous big band leader who went missing on a flight during World War II. So Glenn Miller was a renowned American band leader, composer, and trombonist during the swing era of the 30s and 40s. But Miller had joined in the war effort, and on December 15th of 1944, Miller boarded a small UC-64 Norseman aircraft in England en route to France for a series 
series of performances to entertain troops that were stationed there. But Miller's plane never reached its destination. Somewhere over the English Channel, the aircraft disappeared without a trace. The plane and remains of the passengers were never found. One theory is that the plane actually was shot down uh, after receiving friendly fire from English planes, and this was then covered up. In the chaos at the time, it's very possible that Miller's plane might have been mistaken for an enemy craft. But there could have also just been mechanical failure or some other accident and the plane just went down, never to be found. Next up is the BSAA Stardust. On August 2nd of 1947, tragedy struck as the British South American Airways Lancastrain, known as Stardust, was on its way from Buenos Aires to Santiago, Chile. The aircraft crashed into Mount Tupungato in the Argentine Andes. The wreckage wasn't found for years, and it wasn't until the late 90s that fragments of the missing aircraft started to emerge from glacial ice. And then from the parts of the wreckage, researchers were able to figure out the crew must have become disoriented about their exact location, and mistakenly, thinking they'd already cleared the mountaintops, they started their descent, not realizing they were still behind clouds covered peaks so then they crashed into the mountain everyone on board would have died and the aircraft was buried beneath snow and ice one of the mysteries about this case for a long time is the final Morse code transmission from Stardust to Santiago Airport the last word Stendek was received four minutes before the scheduled landing and it was repeated twice the message most likely translates to severe turbulence encountered now descending emergency crash landing and that's not the only plane that had an unfortunate run-in with the Andes Mountains. The Uruguayan Air Force Flight 571 incident, uh, one of the most insane tales involving a plane in history. So in 1972, an aircraft carrying 45 passengers, including members of the Uruguayan rugby team, their friends and family, left from Uruguay to Santiago, Chile. As the aircraft approached the Andes, the plane crashed into the mountains. The impact instantly claimed the lives of several of the passengers, but there were survivors who now found themselves stranded. There was extreme cold and they had little to no food. They started to realize that there was a good chance they weren't going to be found, at least not anytime soon. And so in order to survive, some resorted to eating people who had already died. Pretty grim. But two survivors made the decision to venture out in search of help. They traveled on foot for days until they finally encountered three men on horseback who were able to communicate with them for help. Finally, the remaining survivors were rescued on December 23rd, 1972. Next up on the list, we have Flight 19, probably the most famous Bermuda Triangle tale. So on December 5th of 1945, there was a group of five U.S. Navy Avenger torpedo bombers on a routine training mission. They took off from the Naval Air Station, Fort Lauderdale in Florida, for what they called Navigation Problem 1, basically a navigation exercise. Lieutenant Charles C. Taylor, a seasoned pilot was leading the exercise. The plan was to fly east, turn north, and then head west back to the base. Not too far into the exercise though, Taylor radioed in saying his compass was acting up. He was convinced they were off course, so Flight 19 started going in different directions, trying to figure out where they were. Their fuel started running low, and Taylor told the pilots to ditch their planes in the ocean because they couldn't find land. The last radio call comes in around 6.20 p.m. saying they're getting ready to bail out and then silence. No distress signals, no emergency calls, just nothing. Flight 19 vanished into thin air, seemingly. And what's even crazier is that one of the search and rescue crafts, a flying boat, was uh, then sent out to find the missing pilots and that also disappeared. All 13 crew members were never seen or heard from again. And of course, no bits of Flight 19 or its crew have ever turned up. Just one of the many reasons the Bermuda Triangle is such an unsettling part of the world. Next we have the infamous D.B. Cooper case. It's gotta be one of the most stylish plane jackings of all time. So it's Thanksgiving Eve uh, and a regular dude, seemingly, who we'll later know as D.B. Cooper, hops on a Northwest Orient Airlines flight in Portland, Oregon. He's got a one-way ticket to Seattle. Cooper's dressed like a typical businessman, a suit, he's got a briefcase, 
briefcase, and in that briefcase were explosives. He hands a note to a flight attendant claiming he's got explosives and wants $200,000 and some parachutes. He ends up getting the cash and parachutes he asked for. It takes a few hours of haggling, but eventually Cooper releases the 36 passengers in exchange for the ransom and the parachutes. Cooper instructs the remaining flight crew to head towards Mexico City at a low altitude, keeping the plane slow and with its landing gear down. The plan is to make a quiet escape. Somewhere over the rugged terrains of Washington State, in the middle of a storm, Cooper opens a rear stairway door and takes a leap into the pitch black darkness with his parachute and the ransom money. And that's the last anyone sees of him. The plane lands in Reno, and when they check, D.B. Cooper's no longer on board. It's still not known whether he actually survived the jump or not. He, he may have drowned, had an accident with his parachute, or he may have actually survived and gotten away with the whole thing. Still don't know for sure. And finally, we of course have Malaysia Airlines Flight 370. Uh, you knew this one was coming up. So on March 8th of 2014, the Boeing 777 carrying 239 passengers and crew seemingly vanished without a trace during its journey from Kuala Lumpur to Beijing. Beijing. Just less than an hour after the takeoff, the aircraft disappeared from radar screens, leaving no distress signals or communication indicating that there were any issues. At first, the search for Flight 370 focused on the Gulf of Thailand and the South China Sea, where the last contact with air traffic control was made. But then it came out that the plane had made an abrupt turn, changing direction from its planned route, and flew for several hours before satellite data showed it likely went down in the southern Indian Ocean. All 227 passengers and 12 crew were presumed dead, and the incident became the deadliest involving a Boeing 777 and the deadliest in Malaysia Airlines history. That is until Malaysia Airlines Flight 17 was shot down over Ukraine just a few months later. Really bad year for Malaysia Airlines. The search for MH370 became the most expensive in aviation history. Several pieces of debris confirmed to be from the plane uh, washed ashore in the Western Indian Ocean in 2015 and 16, and there was a three-year search covering 120,000 square kilometers of ocean. But the Joint Agency Coordination Center suspended its activities in January 2017 without having located the aircraft. There was also a second search in January of 2018 by private contractor Ocean Infinity, but they also came up empty-handed after six months. So you've probably heard of the Bermuda a triangle, but have you heard of the Alaskan Triangle? Believe it or not, the lesser known Alaskan Triangle is home to far more unexplained disappearances due to treacherous terrain, electromagnetic anomalies, hidden pyramids or aliens, or perhaps just something in the air that happens to drive people mad. Whatever it may be, here are the top 10 disappearances in the Alaskan Triangle that remain unsolved to this day. First on the list, we have the 1950 disappearance of a United States Air Force troop plane, a Douglas C-54 Skymaster carrying 44 passengers and a nuclear warhead. What started off as a regular flight from an Air Force base in Alaska to one in Manitoba turned into a years-long mystery that still perplexes the minds of both military personnel and civilians alike. When the flight took off, the pilots were instructed to keep in contact with the Alaskan base, providing status updates via radio at every 30-minute mark, which they did until they didn't. The last report the base received was was that while there was some frost forming on the wings, a completely normal occurrence when flying in cold weather, everything was going smoothly. The radio silence that followed was quickly accompanied by a large search party consisting of both ground and aerial efforts, but no one and nothing was ever recovered. The Douglas was an incredibly large plane, so for it to just simply vanish without a trace has continued to baffle many minds to this day. Now, if you've even just scratched the surface of the Alaskan Triangle's many mysterious mishaps, I guarantee you've heard about the disappearance of Hale Boggs and Nick Begish. If you haven't, you're about to, and if you have, stick around because you might learn something new. On October 16th of 1972, the United States representatives of the Democratic Party, along with one assistant and a pilot, set off on a campaign trip to Alaska, during which they would be forced to test their luck with the Alaskan Triangle. Any goodbyes or see you soon shared with friends or loved ones prior to takeoff would have been the last anyone would receive from any of the men, as you've probably guessed, they never made it to their destination. Not only that, but the men along with the aircraft completely 
vanished. Many search parties canvassed the area, a charge led by the United States government who suspected a possible assassination of the men, but no trace of either plane nor passengers were ever found. However, something else might have been. Which of course brings us to our next point. You guys know I love a good segue. The dark pyramid, as it's called, was discovered among the grounds in which frenzied groups frantically searched for bogs and baggage. Well, its presence was discovered by land surveyors who had used a ground penetrating radar in an attempt to locate the lost plane. While no such aircraft turned up, something did. Something big and buried far beneath the snow was registering on the men's equipment and it appeared to be pyramid shaped. It was getting dark so the men decided to call it for the night, but when they returned to the same place the next day, their findings shocked them. They found nothing. Not a single trace of the gigantic structure they had found less than just 24 hours before. And all of a sudden, their participation in the search was over. Well, some believe these men to be complete nut jobs, either seeing things or misreading their tools, many believe they got it absolutely right. Not only that, but some people even argue that the reason they were unable to find it the next day is because the American government messed with the electromagnetics of the area, rendering the equipment useless in an attempt to keep the pyramid hidden. Speculation as to what the structure might be used for include secret government testing, a United States alien base, and even a massive power source. Could this mysterious find be the source of Alaska's long-standing dark streak of missing persons? Let us know what you think in the comments. Moving into individual disappearances, we have missing person Thomas Anthony Newsy, who was reported missing on June 19th of 2001. Newsy was a traveling nurse whose main purpose in life was helping people, and at the time of his disappearance, he had been working in Bethel, Maine, but was staying in Anchorage, Alaska. He was last seen on video surveillance purchasing snacks and a pack of cigarettes accompanied by an unknown woman. After Newsy's disappearance, a search for the man's whereabouts began in which they questioned the housekeepers at the motel where he was staying. And the housekeepers revealed that during their rounds, they had in fact seen a strange man and woman in Newsy's room. We're unaware if this was the same woman that had been caught with him at the gas station on the security camera. Along with the information provided by the housekeepers, Newsy's bike was also discovered near the motel outside of his storage unit, and his jeep about 12 miles out of town. Not much else is known, but some speculate that the woman with Nezzy at the gas station was partners with the man at the motel, believing that the two forced Nezzy to empty his storage unit of its valuables and then drove his jeep away from the scene of the crime. But perhaps he was simply just helping a young couple with an injury? He was a nurse after all. But neither reason really lends any explanation as to what happened to Newsy himself though, so I guess I'll leave that up to you guys to decide. And next on the list we have Frank Minano, an expert on sustainable living, hunting, and Alaskan culture, whose disappearance shocked the small town of Ninana, which is located directly in the center of the Alaskan Triangle. Frank was 69 when he was reported missing on August 17th of 2020 by his family after they believed him to have gotten lost in the woods. Authorities, aware of Frank's talents, believe that he must have taken shelter in a nearby cabin after becoming turned around in the night. A search party was sent out to canvas the area with high hopes for the man's safe return. However, disappointment and dismay began to sink in after days of searching resulted in not one single indication of Frank's whereabouts. There is not much else that is known about this story other than the fact that four years later Frank still remains missing and the tragedy remains a mystery. Next on the list we have Shanna Omen, yet another disappointing appearance in which, honestly, not much is known. The woman went missing on June 3rd of 2019 after spending time at a friend's house in Fairbanks, Alaska. According to the friend, after hanging out, they had dropped her off at Nico River, a short walk from where Omen had lived. They assumed nothing of it until several hours later when Omen's roommate called the friend saying that she had never returned home. Scared and confused, they called the police, who quickly put together a search party to comb the area in which Shanna had last been seen, but after much effort, they were ultimately unsuccessful. No other information has been released about the ongoing missing persons case, but as with all the names on this list, we are still hoping for a happy ending. Next up, we have Leonard Lane, a World War II veteran who, at the time of his disappearance on July 4th of 1995, was 73 years old. Lane, who had a very distinct limp due to injuries obtained during the war, had decided to take a walk after a local parade in the town of Fairbanks, Alaska. He went out into the woods of the Alaskan Triangle alone 
phone. A mistake which presumably would end up costing him his life. Although efforts were made to locate the man, he was never found and in 1997, two years after his disappearance, Leonard Lean was declared legally dead. However, the case remains unsolved. And starting off our final three, we have Jail Tiara Hamblin, a mother of one who went missing on October 11th of 2014. That evening, Jail and her roommate Kendra had gone out to dinner. When they returned home, Kendra went to bed, but Jail decided that she wasn't tired and instead texted one of her male friends around 1 a.m. asking him if he would like to get together. And at 3 a.m., she sent a text to an unknown man. When Kendra woke up the next morning, she sent Jail a text, and when Jail didn't text back, Kendra decided to knock on her door to check on her, but she was gone. After not hearing from her all day, Kendra began to worry and called Jail's mother, who reported her missing to police on October 14th of 2024. Despite efforts, no trace of Jail was found until five months later, when her purse, containing her cell phone, social security number, and ID, was discovered by hikers buried in the snow. Her mother maintains that Jail would not have left her purse behind willingly, nor would she have abandoned her son. While the case remains unsolved, foul play is the most likely cause of this woman's disappearance. Next on the list we have Alan Foster who went missing on September 9th of 2013 during a solo flight over the Alaskan Triangle while piloting a Piper 32 260 aircraft. After fueling up, Foster headed straight for the airspace above the infamous Alaskan Triangle and informed the region's flight service via radio that he had planned to touch down at Cordova Airport, a destination which would later prove to be out of reach for the flyer. Just 18 minutes after takeoff, the airport's radar showed Alan Foster's aircraft craft descending almost 1,100 feet at a rapid pace before disappearing completely. Neither Alan nor his plane were ever discovered despite multiple search efforts for the two. No one is quite sure what happened here, but many are hesitant to chalk it up to either operator or mechanical error, as the plane was in perfect working condition and Alan was an expert flyer, with over 9,700 hours of airtime in various planes. The only real conclusion made regarding Alan's disappearance is that it just doesn't make any sense. And finally, we have Paul Michael Lemaitre, a 65 year old marathoner who went missing in the Alaskan Triangle on June 4th of 2012. That year, Paul had decided to compete in the Mount Marathon race for the first time and had trained accordingly leading up to the day. The race took off without a hitch as competitors took off on their 26.2 mile run, three and a half miles of which would consist of participants navigating through the creeks and trees of the Alaskan mountain. Paul was last seen at the home stretch just two 200 meters from the finish line, and he was confirmed to be fully cognizant by a steward monitoring participants and verbally confirming bib numbers, an interaction which would become the last known record of Paul Michael. After speaking with the steward, Paul began his short descent to the finish line, but unfortunately he never made it as he suddenly disappeared without a single trace, never to be seen again. Despite the efforts of mountain rescue experts, state troopers, and search dogs, no trace of Paul was ever found, and to this day, his disappearance in the the Alaskan Triangle remains a complete mystery. Cold cases leave you with this awful feeling in the pit of your stomach. It's this unsettling reminder that good doesn't always triumph over evil, that the world can be a cruel place and sometimes the innocent have to pay the price. Today we're talking about some of the eeriest unsolved mysteries. We're going to start off the list with the Springfield Three. So it's June of 1992, and two friends, Stacy McCall and Susie Streeter, have just graduated high school. They go to their graduation party and leave at around 2.15 a.m. Their plan is to spend the night at another friend's place, Jane Kirby, and then go to a water park the next day. But Jane's place was too crowded, so they decided to sleep at Susie's mom's place. The next day, Jane and her boyfriend headed to the water park as planned, they waited around for a bit, but no sign of Susie or Stacy. Eventually, they went over to the house to see what they were up to. They knocked, no answer, knocked again, nothing. They didn't seem to be home, but the door was unlocked and all of their cars were parked outside. A few hours go by and then Stacy's mom, Janice, comes over to investigate. They all entered the home to discover that yeah, there was nobody home. Even stranger, even stranger than their car still being outside, though all of their purses were still home. Even Susie and her mom Cheryl's cigarettes were still there. On top of that, there was no sign of a struggle. It was as if they just vanished into thin air. And with no leads, 
there wasn't much anyone could do but aimlessly search around. Until this day, the case is still a complete mystery. Next on the list is Mr. Cruel. So this case is incredibly creepy. From 1987 to 1990, there were three attacks made by a still unknown assailant in Melbourne, Australia. He wore a balaclava, so victims were never able to get a good look at his face. All we have to go off is this unsettling police sketch. The media soon dubbed him Mr. Cruel, and the name really fits. This guy broke into three family homes with the entire families present and would torment them. He'd tie the parents up and cut the phone lines before abducting the youngest of the family. You can only imagine the despicable things. You can only imagine the despicable things this guy did after that. Now, fortunately, his three victims would eventually be released, but Mr. Cruel was never found or even identified. All right, the Tylenol case. This incredibly disturbing case happened in 1992 in Chicago. Someone tampered with Tylenol bottles, lacing them with potassium cyanide. A young girl died first after taking an extra strength Tylenol. Then the next day, three members of a single family all died after consuming Tylenol from the same bottle. To on top of that, three separate people also died that day after taking Tylenol. When it was discovered that the Janices had died as a result of Tylenol, laced with three times the fatal amount of cyanide, a press conference was held advising people not to take Tylenol for the time being. Eventually, this led to the product being pulled, like loads of product from the shelves, and it was uh, recalled nationwide eventually. Now we have things like pull stickers on bottles because of incidents just like this. The case really falls into that category of crime I've always found deeply unsettling. Like, I mean, everything on this list is very disturbing, but the idea you could just walk into a drugstore and buy something off the shelf completely unaware that it's been poisoned by some unknown creep with a sick thrill of harming other people completely at random, absolutely nightmarish. Next up, we have the case of Russell and Shirley Dermond. Russell and Shirley were an elderly couple living in Putnam County, Georgia. They lived in a very quiet, safe neighborhood. Nothing bad ever happened there. But sometime between May 1st of 2014, when they were last known to be alive, and May 4th, when they failed to show up to an event they'd planned to attend with their neighbors, the couple met a grisly end. One neighbor, growing concerned, decided to check on them. He knocked on their door and got no answer, but the door was unlocked. He eventually made a horrific discovery. Russell's decapitated body was lying in the garage, but Shirley was nowhere to be found. It wasn't until 10 days later that Shirley's body was found in a lake about five miles from the home. She'd suffered blunt force trauma to the head. And sadly, the case was a total dead end. There were no witnesses, no evidence of a motive behind the attack, let alone a suspect. So the case remains unsolved to this day. Russell's head hasn't even been found. Next, we have the mysterious death of Robert Wan. So this is a very, very strange case. So on the night of August 2nd of 2006, Juan, who is a lawyer, was staying at the home of three friends, Joseph Prince, Victor Zaborski, and Dylan Ward in Washington, DC. That night, he was supposed to sleep in a guest room, but he was found dead in the room from stab wounds. The three housemates called the police, claiming that an unknown intruder must have entered the house, but investigators found little evidence of any forced entry, and even stranger, there were no signs of a struggle, like as if one hadn't tried to defend himself at all. This meant he was likely incapacitated with a paralyzing agent before being stabbed. The other strange part was the, the lack of blood. There was none. There wasn't even any coming out of his wounds. It was such an oddly clean crime scene. Suspicion fell on Price, Zaborski, and Ward. They were later charged with obstruction of justice, conspiracy, and tampering with evidence. As it seemed, they were not fully cooperating with the investigation. And during the trial, the defense maintained their innocence though, arguing that Juan's death was indeed caused by some unknown intruder. In 2010, the three housemates were acquitted of the criminal charges. The judge noted that the prosecution had failed to prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, 
That's a pretty infuriating way for the case to end because obviously these three housemates had something to do with Juan's death. Uh, but what was the motive? That's the question. Next is the case of the Setagaya family. On the night of December 30th, 2000, in the Setagaya ward of Tokyo, the Miyazawa family, composed of Mikio Miyazawa, his wife Yasuko Miyazawa, their daughter Nina, and son Ray, died in their own home at the hands of an unknown assailant. The crime was discovered on New Year's Day when a neighbor noticed bloodstains in the window of the Miyazawa residence and contacted the police. Authorities would find the lifeless bodies of the Miyazawa family and it had been a pretty gruesome scene. All four family members had been bound, beaten, and stabbed to death. And the assailant stuck around for a while after committing the act. He ate some of their food, he cruised the internet for a bit, and left without taking any valuable items. Whoever this person was, they're still out there, unless they've died since. And it's frustrating because there was so much evidence at the scene. There was DNA and fingerprints everywhere, but somehow the perpetrator has never been identified. All right, the Brandon Swanson case. This is yet again a completely baffling case. In southwestern Minnesota in May of 2008, Brandon Swanson, a college student, suddenly went missing. On the night of May 14th, Brandon was driving home from a party. At some point, he got lost and then got his car stuck in a ditch. He phoned up his father, trying to give him his whereabouts. His parents drove to his whereabouts and tried flashing their headlights, but Brandon said he didn't see them. So he told his dad, you know what, I'm just gonna walk to a nearby town to get some help. He could see lights in the distance that he believed was the nearby town of Lind. Dad then stayed on the phone with him as he walked towards the town. At some point during the call though, Brandon suddenly exclaimed, oh sh, and then went silent. They tried to call Brandon again, thinking the call had just disconnected, but they couldn't reach him. He's, he hasn't been seen or heard from since. Next, we have the Florence Salon case. On a cool November morning in 2001 in Florence, Montana, a customer arrived at the Hair Gallery Salon for a scheduled appointment. What they found was the scene of a deadly crime. Three women were dead, including Dorothy Harris, the owner of the salon, Brenda Patch, a manicurist, and Cynthia Paulus, a customer. Their throats had all been slit. Once again, there was nothing to go off here, no witnesses. No clear motive or suspect, just three innocent women whose lives were taken seemingly at complete random. The case of Laurie Deppies. Laurie Deppies, a 20-year-old woman, disappeared on August 19th of 1992 from Menasha, Wisconsin. On the night of her disappearance, Lori had been working at a local photography studio and was last seen leaving her shift. She had plans to meet her boyfriend at his apartment later that evening, but never arrived. Well, she'd made it into the parking lot, but never physically into the building. People inside the apartment heard her drive up. They heard her car door shut, but that was it. She never came in. Her car was found in the parking lot of the apartment complex. A styrofoam cup of soda was on top of it, but no sign of Lori, and she's never been found. I can't imagine how completely devastating this would be and confusing, just awful. We always think of, you know, if my loved one is, heaven forbid, goes missing, they'll probably be when I'm not around. They'll probably be somewhere off alone. But the fact that she was right there, outside the apartment, like car in the parking lot, they heard her getting out of the car and then just poof, gone. It's, has to be absolutely maddening. Finally though, we have the infamous Yuba County 5 case. This is one of the most mysterious cases in the United States. Five young men in Yuba County, California disappeared in 1978. Theodore Weir, Jack Hewitt, and Gary Matthias were a group of friends, all with intellectual disabilities of some kind. They disappeared after attending a college basketball game. After the game, the men were last seen at a convenience store. They had plans to return home to Yuba County, but they never made it back. Their abandoned car was later found in a remote and mountainous area called Plumas National Forest. The car was stuck in the snow and there was no sign of the men. It was determined that they'd walked away from the car, even though the weather was very harsh. In June of 1978, 
there was finally a breakthrough in the case. The remains of Ted were discovered in a trailer about 19 miles from where the car had been found. There was food and supplies in the trailer. Where it had seemingly died of starvation and exposure. This was very odd because the trailer was stocked with enough food to keep all five men alive for quite a while and there was stuff there to make fire and everything but none of that had been used. Then Jack and Bill were found the following day, about 11 miles from the car, and all that was left of Bill were bones, and Jack looked to have been partially eaten by an animal. Jackie's remains were found two days later, and as for Gary, he was never found. So what went on here? Why did they leave so far from the car and try and stay in this trailer? Why didn't they eat the food that was there? We'll likely never know. And we're starting off the list with the Anjakuni village incident. This incident went down November of 1930 up in the northern wilds of Canada. A fur trapper was set to make a stop at the Anjakuni Inuit village to trade furs. But when he arrived, he couldn't believe what he was seeing. The whole place was deserted, not a soul around. The trapper claimed that the food supplies were still there, but the people were gone. He went to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and they sent detachment to check things out. Their report backed up the trapper's story. The village was empty and it seemed that the 2,000 Inuit residents had vanished without a trace. The villagers had left behind some strange things too. Sled dogs had been left behind to starve to death and even rifles had been left behind. Things you just wouldn't abandon. The official line from the Mounties was that the Inuit probably just up and left due to some kind of panic or mass migration, but the sheer abruptness of it all makes for a pretty eerie mystery. I mean, like, why leave your gear and your dogs behind? At our number nine spot is the Yuba County Five. This all went down in February of 1978 in California, and it's a pretty baffling story. So five men, Jack Madruga, Bill Sterling, Jack Hewitt, Ted Wire, and Gary Matthias set out for a college basketball game in a 68 Mercury Montego. Each had varying degrees of intellectual disability or psychiatric conditions. Now, after the game, they went missing. The car was later found stuck in the snow in the Plumas National Forest, but the guys were nowhere to be seen. And then months later, four of them turned up dead in the wilderness. They died from exposure and it seemed like they struggled to survive. They were found in an abandoned trailer with some clothing taken from another trailer nearby. But Gary Matthias was never found. No trace. It's like the guy just vanished into thin air. The whole case was obviously pretty strange. Why leave the car and why head into the snowy woods in the first place? Nothing added up. The case remains a complete mystery to this day. And at number eight, we have the Flight 19 incident. So Flight 19 was a squadron of five US Navy Avenger torpedo bombers that disappeared over the Bermuda Triangle on December 5th, 1945, during routine training flight. So the squadron departed from Naval Air Station Fort Lauderdale in Florida on a navigation exercise known as Navigation Problem 1. The flight was led by experienced pilot Lieutenant Charles C. Taylor and was scheduled to fly eastward for a certain distance, then turn north and finally west back to base. Shortly into the exercise, Taylor reported that his compass was malfunctioning, leading him to believe that the squadron had flown off course. Flight 19 continued to fly in various directions, and the situation became increasingly challenging for both the pilots and ground control as fuel levels started to drop Taylor eventually instructed the pilots to ditch their aircraft in the ocean once they realized they could not find land. The last radio transmission from Flight 19 occurred around 6.20 p.m., indicating that the pilots were preparing to abandon their planes. No distress signals or emergency calls were received after that point. An even stranger flying boat was sent out in search of the missing pilots, and that aircraft went missing as well, uh, as well as all 13 crew on board. No wreckage or traces of Flight 19 or the search and rescue crew were ever found. Number seven, Roanoke Colony. In 1587, a group of about 115 settlers established the Roanoke Colony, led by John White. Soon after, White left the island to return to England for supplies and more assistance. He made it back to the island by 1590, expecting to be greeted by the settlers, but astonishingly, there was nobody there. 
the entire colony had seemingly vanished without a trace. There were no dead bodies and virtually no clues as to where they could have gone. Aside from the words Croatoan carved into a post and crow on a nearby tree. One theory suggests that the settlers may have relocated to Croatoan Island, now known as Hatteras Island, as indicated by the carvings. They also may have attempted to escape the island by sea and got lost. Another possibility is that they integrated with the native population. There have been numerous speculations over the centuries, but the fate of the Roanoke colony is one of American history's greatest mysteries to this day. Next up on the list, we have the Flannan Isles Lighthouse Incident. Lighthouses have a certain vibe about them, don't they? They've always been the perfect setting for a ghost tale. Well, this next lighthouse story is a real life documented incident, one of the strangest cases of mysterious mass vanishings in history. On December 15th, 1900, a ship noticed that the Flannan Isles Lighthouse on the west coast of Scotland didn't seem to be operating. This information reached a relief vessel, which arrived on the 26th. James Ducott, Thomas Marshall, and Donald MacArthur, the keepers, were nowhere to be found. The beds were unmade, the clock had stopped, and a set of outdoor oil skins were missing. The island's log revealed some strange entries in the days leading to their disappearance. On December 12th, Thomas Marshall noted severe winds, but Nothing too out of the ordinary, but he mentioned that James Ducott, the second keeper, had been quiet, and Donald MacArthur, the third keeper, was crying. The relief keeper reported that the lighthouse's equipment and lamps were in working order. It was as if the keepers had simply vanished into thin air. In at number five, we have the case of the Sauter family. In the rugged hills of West Virginia, the Sauter family lived a simple life. George and Jenny Sauter, two Italian immigrants, were building a life with their nine children. But fate had a cruel twist in store for them on Christmas Eve of 1945. Fire erupted in the home. George and Jenny, along with four of their children, managed to escape the inferno. But where were the other five? Days turned into weeks, and the Sodders clung to hope. They believed that they were still alive because there were no bodies to be found. The authorities were quick to chalk the tragedy up to an electrical mishap, claiming the fire started inside the house. But George and Jenny just weren't buying it. They knew the house had been recently rewired and inspected. George had been unafraid to voice his disdain for the fascist government of Italy at the time and believed the fire may have had ties to the Sicilian mafia. He thought his outspokenness had drawn their attention. The vanishing of the MV Gioia crew. The MV Gioia was a merchant vessel and on October 3rd of 1955, it left Samoa for the Takalu Islands. But when it failed to reach its destination, folks got worried. The trek was only supposed to take 48 hours. On November 10th, the Joyita was found adrift about 600 miles off course. The ship was in bad shape too, it was partially submerged, and there was no sign of the 25 people who should have been on board. Lifeboats were missing, and there were indications of a struggle bloodstains in a doctor's bag that had been tossed around. The Joyito is meant to stay afloat even if flooded, but it was almost underwater. But it didn't sink and it was towed back to port. But nobody ever found the crew. No bodies, no survivors, no trace. The missing crew of the Mary Celeste. So it all started back in 1872 when the Mary Celeste set sail from New York, commanded by Captain Benjamin Briggs. On board were his wife, daughter, and seven other crew members. Everything seemed normal as the ship sailed into the vast Atlantic Ocean. Fast forward to December 4th of that same year. A passing ship, the Die Gratia, spotted the Mary Celeste, and something was off. The ship was just floating there, no crew in sight. They boarded the Celeste to take a look around, and not a soul on deck. Not a person in the rigging. It was like they vanished into thin air. Complete silence on the open sea. The ship wasn't in shambles either. The cargo was intact and there was no damage to the vessel. Almost everything was intact though. The only thing missing was a single lifeboat. But no signs of a struggle, no bloodstains, just an empty ship drifting in the vastness of the ocean. The ship's log offered no clues either. The last entry was like any other day at sea. No hints of trouble, no distress signals. It was as if the crew just decided to abandon the ship for no apparent reason. Number two, Flight 370. 
On March 8th of 2014, a routine flight from Kuala Lumpur to Beijing. Uh, the night was dark, the skies clear, but little did anyone know this would be no normal flight. As the Boeing 777 soared over the South China Sea, communication suddenly went silent. The plane vanished from radar, leaving air traffic controllers in complete shock and confusion. The plane had seemingly gone off the grid without a trace. Search and rescue teams searched the vast expanse of the Indian Ocean, but the plane, along with 239 souls on board, seemed to have slipped into another dimension. The theory is that the incident was caused by mechanical failure or, most likely, deliberate actions by the pilot. The aircraft had changed course and flew off the radar. No distress signal, no explanation. As months turned into years, there were only unanswered questions. Some said it was a hijacking, others claimed a government cover-up, but to this day, the mystery has never been solved. And finally, we have Burmeja. So we've talked about uh, groups of people who have gone missing, flights that have gone missing, entire crews of ships, but how about an entire island just off the map? Barmeja was marked on maps, including those by the Mexican government, as a small island in the Gulf of Mexico. But when authorities tried to locate it in the 20th century, it seemed to have disappeared. In the 1920s and 30s, the Mexican government conducted maritime surveys, and Burmeja was part of the maps. Yet, when the government needed to confirm its coordinates for a maritime boundary agreement with the United States in the 70s, several expeditions were sent out to locate the island, but it was nowhere to be found. There are some interesting theories for this one, ranging from geological changes to cartographic errors. There's also a theory that it was intentionally removed or altered on maps for political reasons. But regardless, the fact remains that Burmeja, which had been marked on maps for centuries, seemingly vanished without any clear explanation. And we're starting things off with the triangular object. This is a piece of recent UFO footage, or UAP, I guess they're often referred to now. The clip was shared to TikTok and YouTube by TR3B. The footage was taken in the Isle of Wight in England. The camera person hurries outside and starts filming, obviously having seen the object before the camera started rolling. And when they point it up at the sky, we clearly see something. It's triangular with three bright glowing lights on each corner. It hovers in the sky, slowly rotating. According to the uploader, the object took off after the camera stopped rolling. It's definitely an intriguing piece of footage. I like how clear it is, but what do you all think? Was it just a drone, a hoax, or a genuine unidentified flying object? Let us know down below. And if you are enjoying this channel, if you're new here, why not uh, hit that subscribe button? We got lots more coming your way. Number nine, the Nessie photos. The Loch Ness Monster's been talked about to death, and for a lot of folks, it's almost become a bit of a joke at this point, but there was actually a considerable amount of Nessie activity this year. Back in August, a photographer by the name of Chai Kelly shared images of a serpentine looking creature in the lock. She'd actually taken the pictures back in 2018, but hadn't shared them publicly until this year. Kelly and her husband had been having lunch at the Doors Inn on the banks of the lock when they spotted something strange maneuvering through the water. It was about 200 meters off the shore, moving right to left at a steady clip. Kelly stated that that at first she thought it may have been a pair of otters or a seal, but that it never came up for air. They never saw the thing's head, so that's pretty strange. All right, we're not done with the Loch Ness Monster, though. Like I said, lots of news about Nessie in 2023. Again, back in August, the Loch Ness Center, which I didn't know existed, and the Loch Ness Exploration Group, who I also didn't know were a thing, set out to conduct the largest hunt for the creature in over 50 years. Drones fitted with infrared cameras were flown over the lock, and hydrophones were used to detect any strange sounds from the murky depths. Hundreds of volunteers also watched from land, attempting to spot any unusual activity in the water. The Loch Ness General Manager Paul Nixon 
talked about the big search, saying it was not just a PR stunt. He also stated that there had been some interesting findings presented to him recently, mostly from sonar contacts showing mysterious objects in the depths of the lock, one of which was quote, the size of a transit van, which has yet to be explained. Next up on the list we have the orb, another piece of UAP footage and not the last on the list. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of alien talk on here, so be prepared for that. The footage was released by the AARO, the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, which is an office within the US Secretary of Defense dedicated to unidentified flying objects or UAPs. This clip is from about eight months back during a Senate hearing. The video was recorded by an MQ-9 Reaper drone and shows what looks to be an orb flying through the air. It moves at a good clip and it's very smooth too. The AARO has stated that they don't know what the object was and that it is a genuine UAP, but they have seen others like it before. Pretty cool stuff. Once again, how do you all weigh in on this one? In at number six, we have earthquake lights. On September 8th of 2023, a powerful earthquake of magnitude 6.8 struck Morocco. Several houses collapsed and other buildings were reported with structural damage. But where does the mystery part come in? Well, right before the chaos ensued, witnesses reported bright lights flashing in the sky. This isn't the first time lights like this have been reported though. This is a phenomenon known as earthquake lights, but experts still don't know exactly what causes them. So these lights, which appear as flashes or streaks in the sky are thought to result from the Earth's crustal stress during tectonic plate movements. The theory is that rocks under immense pressure and friction release these electrical charges that then ionize in the air, creating the lights that we see. But again, that's just a theory. And while researchers have correlated these lights with seismic activity, not all earthquakes are accompanied by earthquake lights, and on rare occasions, they even occur independently. Next up on the list, we have the February UAP sightings. A lot of you probably remember this string of weird incidents, but for those who aren't familiar, the story here is that several mysterious high altitude objects were shot down in February of 2023 over various airspaces. We had objects being spotted over Canada, United States, Latin America, China, and Eastern Europe. It started when several unidentified identified objects were shot down over Alaska, the Yukon, and Lake Huron. The general of NORAD, Glenn D. Van Herc, made a statement at the time saying the objects could be benign, but he wasn't 100% sure. And when asked if they could be of alien origin, he said he just wasn't ruling anything out. It really seems like the government and military, especially like over the course of this year, has just become more open about this stuff. The idea of extraterrestrial life uh, existing, uh, which is really interesting. Either way though, it seems like it's just being discussed more. It's not written off as total nonsense like uh, it used to be more so in the past. Now, here's another interesting part about these cases. There were recovery attempts made. Unfortunately, the objects landed in areas that aren't all that accessible, so it may be pretty difficult uh, to actually recover these objects. And until this point, we still don't know what they are. And I, I think the search has been given up uh, entirely. But I mean, you know, they could have found something and then just not said what it is. You know, there's always, there's always the chance that that's the case. And at number four, we have the UAP landing. This piece of footage was apparently recorded in a rural area of Colombia. So we see this nice landscape view of the rainforest. We see trees, we hear birds. That's all normal, but oh wait, what's that in the sky? It's definitely not a bird or any living animal, at least that we know of. There's no wings flapping first off. Plus, that would be a massive sized bird if it was one. No, it looks to be an object of some kind. You realize it's not actually flying towards the camera, but slowly descending. We watch as it disappears into the tree line. So what could this object be? I'm not a drone expert, so if you are, correct me if I'm wrong, but if that were a drone, it would have to be pretty big, right? The object is far off in the distance, but we see it pretty clearly. If it is a drone, it's definitely not some kid's toy. Now, this next piece of footage was taken years ago, but it wasn't actually shared online until about five months back by Reddit user CuriousAD5774. They said the footage was taken by a friend of their father's 
out in the country in Ontario. In the clip, we see the guy pointing the camera towards the night sky, where we see an object with glowing lights floating there. At first, I thought uh, it was maybe just a satellite, but the guy says the object is just hovering in place. Kind of hard to tell because uh, he's not holding the camera very steadily. Now, looking at this footage, it's also easy to think, you know, what we're seeing is just a drone. But let me read what the Redditor wrote along with the clip. Don't got much to say about this video other than when my dad originally sent it to me, I felt like it had to be a UFO. And there's nothing else that seemed to explain it. Canada is notorious for sightings and I myself have seen a few. This was taken way before drones were being used regularly. I'd say this video is easily 10 years old. At our number two spot, we have the Colorado Bigfoot. Uh, I don't think I was going to get through a whole uh, list of weird, mysterious uh, footage without bringing up Bigfoot at least once. 2023 was a pretty quiet year for Bigfoot sightings, at least ones captured on camera. But this next clip uh, really made the rounds. It was being shared everywhere. It was all over the news. Even Stephen Colbert did a bit on it. So a couple were on a train passing through southern Colorado when they spotted something hiking across the hills in the distance. It looked to be a large furry biped. You hear a lot of people talking in the clip, obviously shocked and confused by what they're looking at. The creature walks across the grass and then kind of like just squats down watching the train as it passes. Now I gotta say for all the supposed Sasquatch footage I've seen, and I've seen a lot, uh, this one is not the most convincing. This could easily be a prankster in a costume, but you know what? I'm entertained by the whole thing. You know, it, it looks hot. He had to go out there in that big furry suit. He's in the middle of nowhere, you know? And I don't know, I commend him. I think that's a commitment to a joke. Finally though, we have the flying saucer. And I say flying saucer, not just because I've exhausted pretty much every other way of saying UFO on this list, but also because this object really does look like your classic flying saucer. So the clip was taken by a pilot. They've already started filming before we actually see anything, so it looks as if they spotted something and then pulled their camera out hoping to see it again. Then they focus on one area of the sky, and we see this dot appear and then rapidly get larger realizing that there's an object hurtling in the direction of the plane before whizzing by at an incredible speed. And slowing the clip down, the object clearly fits the description of that stereotypical alien spacecraft, the most commonly reported type. I really like this video because it's not often you see UFO footage taken in the air, you know, actually getting to see the object pretty close up, just whizzing by at the same vantage point. Could the clip be fake? For sure. But it could be genuine too. It's really hard to say with stuff like this because it's not illogical to think that there could be extraterrestrial life out there. Number 9. Brittany Murphy's Death Actress Brittany Murphy was sick with pneumonia when she collapsed in the bathroom of her home. Firefighters attempted to resuscitate her before she was transported to the Cedar sinai Medical Center, but two hours after the initial 911 call, she died at the hospital from cardiac arrest. An autopsy determined that Brittany died of pneumonia exasperated by anemia and multiple drug intoxication. The drugs, over-the-counter cold medicines and prescription medications were all legal, but at elevated levels. Levels. Her husband Simon Monjack raised suspicions by initially refusing an autopsy to understand exactly what happened to his wife, but just five months later, Simon died in the same bedroom of eerily similar causes, pneumonia and anemia. He also had an elevated level of prescription drugs in his system. Many people believe that the home had toxic mold in it, and Brittany's mother dismissed this idea, as did the coroner, but she later became convinced toxic mold was the cause of the deaths while trying to sell the home. Brittany's father had a different theory that she had her life ended by someone. I have a feeling that there was definitely a murder situation here. He told Good Morning America, yeah, it's poison, yes, yes, I know that. The basis for this claim was the result of an independent toxicology report he had done on a sample of Britney's hair. The report detailed the presence of 10 heavy metals in her hair, which the report claimed suggested the possibility of foul play. Her father later filed a suit against the Los Angeles coroner's office and the Los Angeles Police Department, hoping in vain to have his daughter's body re-examined and the case reopened. Number 8. Natalie Wood's Death 
On November 29, 1981, the actress and movie star Natalie Wood drowned while on a boating trip with her husband, Robert Wagner. Robert had reported Natalie missing after a night of drinking, and her body was found several hours later, floating face down in the water, wearing a flannel nightgown, down jacket, and socks. Now, at first, her death was ruled accidental, but the bruises on her body led law enforcement to consider foul play, with Robert as the prime suspect. The couple had an argument on the yacht before she went missing, a fact Robert initially denied, but fully admitted to in his 2008 autobiography. Further rousing suspicions in the fact that four hours had elapsed between the time Robert and Dennis Davrin, the captain, realized Natalie was missing and when they called the Coast Guard. Most concerning though were the statements that Lana Wood alleges the boat captain Dennis Davrin made to her on a drunken phone call. According to Lana, Dennis said that after the star couple quarreled, it appeared to him as though RJ, Robert Wagner, shoved her away and she went overboard. Dennis panicked and RJ said, leave her there, teach her a lesson. Lena added that Dennis didn't think Robert intended for her sister to drown, but he didn't run to her aid. Number 7. Joe Pinchler Disappearance In the late 90s and early 2000s, child and teen actor Joe Pinchler appeared in a series of small and supporting roles in a number of movies and TV shows, most notably as Brennan Newton and the Beethoven Family film franchise. According to The Charlie Project, Joe spoke with a friend at about 4am on January 5th, 2006 in his northeastern Washington hometown of Bremerton. A few weeks before his 19th birthday, he left his apartment untouched, unlocked, and with the lights on, and apparently took only his wallet and car keys before he disappeared without telling anyone where he might be going, apart from some poems that spoke to his depressing mindset. Four days later, Joe's Toyota Corolla was located in Bremerton, and authorities suspected that Joe may have jumped to his death off a bridge over Port Madison Narrows, but no evidence of that, nor his remains were ever recovered. Number 6. Brian Jones's Death Brian Jones was a musician, songwriter, and record producer. Around midnight on July 2nd, 1969, his body was discovered at the bottom of the swimming pool at his estate. He was pulled from the pool and had CPR performed on him, but was pronounced dead upon arriving at the hospital. Now, Brian's death came just six weeks after Mick Jagger, Keith Richards, and Charlie Watts informed him he was out of the band. Accounts of the night Brian died say that prior to him going for a swim, he had been drinking brandy and taking sleeping pills, and as a result was unsteady on his feet, and his speech was garbled. An autopsy declared his death was due to drowning, later clarified as death by misadventure. His daughter though, Barbara Marion, contends that her father may have had his life ended by someone on purpose, and believes that his death was never properly investigated by the authorities. Rumors have alleged for years that Frank Thorogood, a builder who was working on Brian's house who was the last person to see him alive, may have ended his life after a dispute over money. Number 5. Marilyn Monroe's Death the world was shaken on August 5th, 1962 when Marilyn Monroe was found dead at the age of 36 in her home in Los Angeles. The cause? A barbiturate overdose that was ruled as her most likely taking her own life. Now this led many to doubt the star, rumored to have been involved in extramarital affairs with both John F. Kennedy and his brother Robert F. Kennedy, had taken her own life. Instead, conspiracy theories have long suspected that Marilyn had her life ended by being forced to take the drugs that resulted in her death to keep her from talking about the Kennedy brothers. Now, to this day, the CIA continues to maintain files on Marilyn's death, but it is unlikely anyone will ever know what really happened. Number 4. Death of the Black Dahlia On January 15th, 1947, Elizabeth Short, an aspiring actor, was found dead in residential Los Angeles. Her body was so mutilated as the body was cut in half and so pale and drained of blood that the woman who discovered it thought she had stumbled upon a mannequin. Now, the body was cut with surgical precision, leaving no trauma to internal organs and bones. Her face was also cut from her mouth to ears, leaving an eerie permanent smile. There was no blood on the ground, making it believed that the body was moved after she had died. Nine days after she was discovered, an envelope was sent to the examiner that read, The Los Angeles Examiner and other Los Angeles papers, here is Dahlia's belongings, letter to follow. Now, as promised, the envelope contained her social security card, birth certificate, photographs, names written on pieces of paper, and an address book. Then, on March 14th, a note was found saying, To whom it may concern, I have waited for the police to capture me for the Black Dahlia killing, but have not. I'm too much of a coward to turn myself in, so this is the best way out for me. I couldn't help myself for that or this. Sorry, Mary. Now, although many suspects were named, no authorities were able to identify who ended the Black Dahlia's life. Number 3. Princess Diana's Death Princess Diana was constantly hounded by paparazzi, which resulted in her death. On August 31st, 1997, Diana was fatally injured in a car crash at the 
Point de Lama tunnel in Paris. She left the Ritz in Paris at around 12:20 a.m. and her car went into the tunnel, where the driver lost control and crashed into a pillar. Diana was critically injured but died later that morning in the hospital. Now, because Diana was so loved and hated by the royals for being so loved, there's a conspiracy theory that the royal family planned for her to die. Now, in the months immediately preceding her death, although she was attempting to live her life as normally as she could, even though she got divorced, Diana expressed fears that she would have her life ended, most likely by a staged car crash. The end came in a way similar to how she predicted it, but what we may never know is whether the crash was an accident, as subsequent investigations determined, or staged as she feared. Number two, Shelley Miscavige disappearance. Shelley Miscavige is a member of the Church of Scientology Sea Org who married Scientology leader David Miscavige. She was last seen in public in August of 2007. Since her disappearance, she has been the subject of speculation and inquiries regarding her whereabouts and well being. In 2012, attorneys who said they represented her responded by saying that she was merely living a private life devoted to the Church of Scientology. Some former Sea Org members have said that they believe Shelley is being held against her will at the compound of the Scientologist Church of Spiritual Technology Corporation near the mountain town of Running Springs in San Bernardino County, California. In August 2013, actress Leah Remini, a former Scientologist and critic of the organization, filed a missing persons report regarding Shelley with the Los Angeles Police Department, which was closed within hours by the LAPD as unfounded. So where is Shelley? It seems like we might never know. And coming in at number one is Elliot Smith's death. Elliot Smith was a musician and singer-songwriter. There was lots of controversy surrounding his death as it was just strange. Elliot died on October 21st, 2003 from two stab wounds to the chest. He was at his apartment where he lived with his girlfriend, Jennifer Chiba. According to Jennifer, the two were arguing and she locked herself in the bathroom to take a shower. She heard him scream and upon opening the door, saw Elliot standing with a knife in his chest. She pulled the knife out, after which he collapsed and she called 911. While his death was reported as him taking his own life, the official autopsy report released in December 2003 left open the question of homicide. The report said that he had been stabbed twice, both wounds had entered his chest cavity, and one had perforated his heart. That in itself is not suspicious. Gruesome as it sounds, people who choose to stab themselves to death frequently jab the weapon into their chest a number of times. Elliot, however, had no hesitation wounds, cuts made as the victim works up the nerve to force the weapon through, and he had stabbed himself through his clothing. The autopsy also found small lacerations on both of his hands and under his right arm, which it described as possible defensive wounds. Claim that Jennifer reported removal of the knife from Elliot and subsequent refusal to speak with detectives were all of concern. And number 10 is the Axeman of New Orleans. In the annals of American crime, one chilling tale that sends shivers down your spine is the Axeman of New Orleans. This elusive and malevolent figure terrorized the city during a horrifying spree that left the trail of gruesome unaliving. The Axeman's modus of operandi was brutal as it was perplexing, breaking into homes, wielding an axe or razor, and butchering his victims. What's truly unsettling is that these unalivings don't appear to have any clear motive. The victims were predominantly Italian immigrants or Italian Americans, sparking theories of ethnic hatred. But the mystery deepens when some suggest that the Axeman may have just been a sadistic fiend who specifically targeted women. And here's where it gets truly bizarre. There's even a theory that he eliminated to promote jazz music. What? A letter attributed to the Axeman claimed that he'd spare anyone with a jazz band playing in their home on a specific night. Are you serious? And New Orleans heeded that call. Jazz echoed throughout the city, and that night, no one fell victim to the Axeman's gruesome axe. What? To this day, the identity of the Axeman remains unsolved. At number 9 is the Cleveland Torso Unaliver. Active between 1935 and 1938, this unidentified serial killer left a trail of grisly unalivings in their wake. Officially, they claimed about a dozen victims, but there could be way more. What makes this case even more unsettling is the gruesome way the unaliver operated. They beheaded and often dismembered their victims and sometimes even severed torsos and appendages. Most of the male victims were castrated. The cause of the unaliving in many cases was the horrific dismembering itself, meaning that the people were alive as it was happening. Oh lord. The victims were often drifters, folks who lived on the fringes of society during the Great Depression. Their identities were hard to establish, which was a common theme for this enigma. Forensic science in the era was far from what it is today, making it even more challenging to identify the victims, especially since the heads were often missing. But here's the twist. The Cleveland Torso Unaliver had the audacity to taunt law enforcement. They sent 
postcards and even placed remains where the authorities couldn't miss them right in front of Elliot Ness's office. Ness, who was famous for taking on Al Capone and led the Untouchables, couldn't crack this case. To this day, the identity of the Cleveland torso and Aliver remains a haunting mystery. If you're enjoying this video so far, you can support the channel by pressing like, subscribing to Most Amazing, and ringing that notification bell. At number eight is the Zodiac Unaliver. This unidentified serial Unaliver operated in the late 1960s, plunging Northern California into a state of fear and panic. What sets this case apart is its brazen nature as the Unaliver's penchant for taunting the media and authorities. He struck in various locations, targeting young couples and even even a lone cab driver. But here's the truly unsettling part. The Zodiac claimed to have unalived over 37 people, leaving a trail of cryptic letters, some containing still unsolved ciphers. Only one of these ciphers was cracked in 2020. It's a real life puzzle that the world is desperately trying to solve. Though Arthur Lee Allen, a former teacher and convicted offender, was named as a suspect, the case remains unsolved. The Zodiac's eerie ability to vanish into obscurity has made it an eerie mystery, with investigations still open to this day. Will we ever unmask the infamous Miss Zodiac, only time will tell. At number seven is Bible John, who operated in Glasgow back in 1968 and 69. But what's so baffling about this case, you ask? Well, it's the fact that this guy managed to off three people without ever getting caught. All of his victims were brunettes between the ages of 25 and 32. They all crossed paths with their sinister dance partner at the Barlow Land Ballroom, a place for fun and music that turned into a nightmarish crime scheme. But it didn't stop there, folks. This guy was called Bible John because he had a knack for quoting scripture and condemning condemning adultery, especially when he was with his last victim. The police have never been able to pin down his identity, despite one of the most extensive manhunts in history. And what's even more mind-boggling is that some folks even thought Peter Tobin, another convicted serial unaliver, might be Bible John, but nope, he got eliminated as a suspect and the mystery lingers on. At number six is the Freeway Phantom. The Freeway Phantom, a mysterious and deeply unsettling case, has baffled investigators for decades, which takes us on a chilling journey through the mysteries of American crime. This cold-blooded villain, harboring a seething rage against society, committed a series of heinous crimes that terrorized the Washington area. His motive is obscured in a shroud of darkness, which could be rooted in untreated psychological turmoil, perhaps depression, and definitely anger towards women. The Phantom's elusive persona, concealed behind a mask and a vehicle, suggests a methodical approach to his sinister deeds. His knowledge of the region's local stories hints at a connection to the area. The abduction and unaliving of his victims reveal a psychopathic disposition with deep-seated misogyny. The brutality of these crimes, coupled with a military-like precision, has led some to speculate about this person being a Vietnam veteran. At number five is the West Mesa Unalivings. Eleven women, the remains discovered in 2009, buried beneath a dusty New Mexico desert. It's one of those American mysteries that might never be completely unraveled. Originally, people thought it was the work of a serial unaliver, but there's a twist here. Actually, a possible connection to a trafficking ring. An anonymous tip pointed fingers at a suspect from Central America, but it doesn't stop there. Cops even suspected a trafficking ring operating through Texas, preying on people of the night during big events across the Southwest. This complex web of darkness stretches across various states, leaving us with more questions than answers. At number four is the Helio Beach Serial Unalivings, a spine-tingling mystery that spans nearly two decades, casting a shadow over Long Island, New York. Between 96 and 2011, the remains of 11 people were discovered, with the majority being workers of the night who had advertised their services on Craigslist. The grim saga began with the disappearance of Shannon Gilbert, leading to an intensive police search in the vicinity of Ocean Park near Gilio Oak Beach. In December 2010, the remains of the Gilio Four were unearthed within a quarter mile of each other, only to be followed by the discovery of six more sets of remains in March and April of 2011. Now, the cause of the unaliving itself remains disputed, with police proposing accidental drowning, while an independent autopsy suggested possible strangulation. In a startling twist, the arrest of Rex Howerman in July of 2023 brought some closure to the case, as he was charged in connection with the unalivings of three of the Gilo 4 victims, and emerged as the prime suspect in the fourth victim's demise. Yet, the lingering mystery remains. Who else might be involved, and what other horrors like in sealed in the shadows of Gilio Beach. And number three is the Oakland County Unaliver. Between 76 and 77, four young people disappeared without a trace. Their bodies were later discovered, each placed in plain sight along roadways and Oakland County. This gruesome puzzle remains one of America's most unsettling unsolved mysteries. Forensic advancements have shed light of potential suspects, but they've only deepened the enigma. DNA testing indirectly implicated two individuals, but the main perpetrator's identity remains hidden. One suspect passed away and the other is serving a life sentence for unrelated crimes. Even
even with a DNA profile of the unaliver, no match has emerged. At number two is the doodler. All right, so let's dive into one of the most unsettling unsolved mysteries in American history. Straight out of California, the doodler. This unsettling serial unaliver terrorized San Francisco between 74 and 75, committing 6 to 16 unalivings and 3 assaults. What makes this case more chilling is how the doodler earned his name. See, before brutally impaling his victims, he would sketch them. The victims were all men, and the suspect targeted them after meeting at gay nightclubs, bars, and restaurants. The disturbing patterns of the victims being stabbed in similar locations adds another layer to the mystery. Despite police efforts, the doodler was never caught. At number one is Charlie Chop. Off. Now, if you think serial unalivings are the stuff of movies and TV shows, think again. Charlie Chopoff is an unidentified serial unaliver who terrorized the streets of Manhattan from 72 to 73. What makes this case even more unsettling was the gruesome nature of the crimes. See, Chopoff's signature move was... 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 You can, you, can, you can probably guess or Google it. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, imagine the fear that gripped the city during those days. Despite a suspect, Erno Sato, confessing to one of the unalivings, he was deemed unfit for trial and sent back to a mental institution, leaving the case open and the mystery unsolved. The question remains, who was Charlie Chopoff? And will we ever uncover the truth behind these horrific crimes? Coming in at number 10 is Russell and Shirley Dermond, Georgia. In May 2014, elderly couple Russell and Shirley Dermond were ex expected to attend a party for the 2014 Kentucky Derby with their neighbors, who grew concerned when the couple did not show up. On May 6th, when the neighbors went into their house to check on them, the neighbor found the door unlocked and entered the house. Russell's decapitated body was found on the floor of his two-car garage, lying in a small pool of blood. When police were unable to locate Shirley inside the house, they initially suspected that she had been kidnapped. Ten days later, Shirley's body was found by a fisherman on Lake Oceanee. An autopsy found that she died from either two or three deep wounds to the head from a blunt object. Now, Russell's head has never been found, and the case remains unsolved to this day. Number 9. Josh Maddox, Colorado. On May 8, 2008, Josh Maddox left the house, telling his sister Kate that he was going out for a walk. He often went out hiking alone, so when his sister saw him at the house before he left, she thought little of it. But when he failed to return later that evening, his family became worried. On May 13th, five days after he disappeared, his father, Mike, called the police to report Josh missing. The authorities, friends, and family scoured the neighborhood and nearby Parkland area where Josh may have decided to go walking. After months of searching, nothing had been uncovered and hopes faded. Then, seven years later, in August 2015, less than a mile away from Josh's home, property developer Chuck Murphy was demolishing an old wood cabin to make way for 32 new family homes. Now, the cabin had been used in years and the inside was damp and rotten. Work to demolish the chimney inside the cabin started and to the surprise of the demolition team, crammed inside the brickwork was a mummified body, which was later confirmed as Josh's. His body was naked apart from a thin shirt and his clothes were neatly stacked inside the cabin. Now, an autopsy found no evidence of any drugs in Josh's remains. He said, the heart tissue showed no signs of trauma. There were no broken bones, no knife marks. There were no bullet holes. There is so far no answers to a number of things. It is very confusing. It was not an instant death. It seems like we might never know what happened to Josh that fateful day. Number eight, Dan Cooper, U.S. Airspace. Now, one of the most famous heists in history occurred on November 24th, 1971, when a man who identified himself as Dan Cooper bought a one-way ticket to Seattle on Northwest Orient Airlines from Portland, Oregon. After the plane was airborne, Dan handed the flight attendant a note. Now, at first, she just put it in her pocket without looking at it, but then he told her, Miss, you better look at that note. I have a... He then opened a briefcase to reveal red-colored sticks surrounded by an array of wires. He told the flight attendant to write down everything he was saying and then take it to the captain. The note said, I want $200,000 by 5 p.m. in cash exclusively in $20 bills, put in a knapsack. I want two back parachutes and two front parachutes. When we land, I want a fuel truck ready to refuel. No funny stuff or I'll do the job. FBI agents assembled the ransom money and Seattle police obtained the parachutes from a local 
skydiving school. When Dan claimed his demands were met, he allowed all passengers and some of the crew to exit the airplane. He told the remaining crew to refuel the plane and chart a course for Mexico City while staying below 10,000 feet. Then somewhere between Seattle and Reno, he jumped from the plane with the money and was never seen again. Now despite an expansive manhunt and over 45 years of searching, no conclusions have been made as to the man's identity or his fate after he jumped. Today it is called one of the greatest cold cases in FBI and US history. Number 7. The Zodiac, California The Zodiac took the lives of five known victims in the San Francisco Bay Area between December 1968 and October 1969. Now he coined this name in a series of taunting letters and cards that he mailed to regional newspapers. Now some of the letters included cryptograms or ciphers in which he claimed that he was collecting his victims as slaves for the afterlife. Now he targeted young couples and a lone male cab driver. Two of his wounded victims survived and the Zodiac would attempt to end the lives of a couple on a hillside at Lake Berryessa, but only the woman would succumb to her injuries. The man would live to tell the story of what happened and give his creepy description of the hooded serial slayer. Now, the Zodiac claimed to have taken the lives of 37 victims and has been linked to several other cold cases, some in Southern California or outside the state. While many theories regarding the identity of the Zodiac have been suggested, the only suspect authorities ever publicly named was Arthur Lee Allen, a former elementary school teacher who died in 1992. Number 6. Amber Hagerman, Texas A young Amber Hagerman was riding her bicycle in a parking lot of an abandoned grocery store in Arlington, Texas on January 13, 1996 when she was kidnapped. A witness told police that he saw a man get out of a black pickup truck, grab her off the bicycle, and force her into his truck as she kicked and screamed. Now despite the massive search, she wasn't found, and then four days later, a man walking his dog found Amber's body in a creek about four miles from where she was abducted. Autopsy reports revealed that she had died of cut wounds to the neck. Now as of January of last year, police have received and investigated more than 7,000 tips related to the case. I miss her every day, and she's just so full of life, and I want to know why, why her? She was only a little girl, Amber's mother, Donna Williams, said last year. Now, police say there is limited evidence in the case, but they hope that the new DNA technologies can help them catch who was responsible. Now, her abduction led to the invention of Amber Alerts, and although some people might think they're annoying, they do save lives. Number 5. Tylenol Poisoning, Illinois On September 29, 1982, seven people in the Chicago area ingested poisoned Tylenol pills, consequently collapsing and dying shortly after. Now, bottles of the popular pain and fever reliever were spiked with cyanide and returned to store shelves, targeting random people. After all the victims were buried on October 1, 1982, it was revealed that the Tylenol bottles were intentionally poisoned. Immediately, over 31 million bottles of Tylenol were recalled by the manufacturer and were issued warnings. They also offered to replace recalled bottles with new bottles and offered a $100,000 reward to anyone who may have any information on the perpetrator. Now, these precautions cost the company over $100 million, and there were several more copycat deaths across the United States after the initial incident had occurred. Now, this led to the invention of the safety seals that you see on medicine bottles today, and to this day, no suspect has ever been charged or convicted of poisonings. Four, the Axeman, New Orleans. From 1918 to 1919, the Axeman of New Orleans ended the lives of six people and left six more severely injured. An Italian grocery store owner and his wife were the first victims. They were found in bed at home with their throats cut and skulls bashed in with an axe. The victims who followed were also found in bed and no valuable belongings were taken. A newspaper received a letter with demands for the following Tuesday night that said, I am very fond of jazz music and I swear by all the devils in the nether regions that every person shall be spared in whose home jazz band plays in full swing at the time I've just mentioned. If everyone has a jazz band going, well then, so much the better for you people. One thing is certain, and that is that some of you people who do not jazz it out on that specific Tuesday night, if there be any, will get the axe. Now on that Tuesday night, the streets of New Orleans filled with jazz and nobody was harmed. Then in October 1919, the deaths ended just as quickly as they had begun, and the criminal was never found. Number three. 
Jeanette De Palmer, New Jersey. In 1972, in Springfield, New Jersey, a dog brought a decomposing forearm to its owner. They quickly alerted the police, and this prompted a police search, and a body was soon found on a cliff. The body was identified as Jeanette De Palmer, a girl who was missing for six weeks. Now, the hill where she was discovered was covered with occult symbols, and many were led to believe that her body was placed on a makeshift altar. Many locals and even some police officers pointed their fingers at an alleged coven of witches who were rumored to have used Jeanette for a human sacrifice, and others said it was a satanic group. Now, reports from local papers mentioned the police couldn't determine the cause of death due to the body's decomposition, and authorities investigated a local homeless man who was a prime suspect, only to find no connection to the crime. Many believe that Jeanette may have provoked a group of Satan-worshipping teens at her high school, since she was involved with a group that helped drug addicts find their faith in Christ. Now, to this day, her death remains unsolved. Number two. Brooklyn Farthing, Kentucky. On June 21st, 2013, Brooklyn Farthing, her younger sister Paige, and cousin went to a field party. Paige and Brooklyn's cousin decided to leave the party early on, while Brooklyn had been plans to sleep over at a friend's house who was also at the party, so she was going to stay. However, when Brooklyn's friend decided she wanted to spend the night at a boy's house, the two argued, and the friend left. Now, towards the end of the party, Brooklyn was seen leaving with two young men, and one of the men was dropped off, but the other man took Brooklyn to his house. It was at around 4 a.m. on June 22nd that Brooklyn called Paige and asked if their cousin could come pick her up. However, the cousin had had too many drinks and was in no condition to drive. Now, Brooklyn didn't want her mother to have to come get her, so she called her ex-boyfriend. He agreed to give her a ride home when he got off work. It was at this point that the man who brought Brooklyn to the house left. Now, before long, Brooklyn's ex-boyfriend received several texts from her saying, can you hurry, please hurry, and then I'm scared. Then another text came in telling the ex to never mind and that Brooklyn was going to another party. He asked who she was going with, but there was no response, and Brooklyn hasn't been heard from or seen since. And coming in at number one is Tara Calico, New Mexico. On the morning of September 20th, 1988 in Bella, New Mexico, Tara Calico borrowed her mother's pink bike to go out for a ride. She planned to play tennis that afternoon and asked her mom to drive out after her in case she got a flat tire and didn't return home by noon. Now, she never did return, and no one knew what happened to her. Every lead went dead until about a year later, when a photo was found depicting a young woman, her age, and a missing boy, both gagged. The Polaroid photograph was found in a parking lot outside a junior food store in Florida. Michael Henley went missing in the same area as Tara in April of 1988 when he was hunting turkeys with his father. Now they appeared to be in the back of a van with a copy of a book written by V.C. Andrews, Tara's favorite author, lying right beside the girl. Now initially Tara's mother didn't think the girl was her, but the girl in the photograph had a scar identical to Tara's. In 1990, Michael Henley's body was found in Zunny Mountains where he was hunting, which strongly disconnected the theory that the two were abducted and taken to Florida, but unfortunately Tara's parents would eventually die, never finding out who took their daughter. And we're going to kick off the list with the legend of the Hookman. Now supposedly on Pond Run Road in the village of New Richmond, there once lived a doctor and his wife. They had a son who was mentally disturbed, and these two were ashamed of him and opted to keep him out of the public eye. This meant chaining him up in the basement whenever people were over or when they just didn't want him in their presence. One night, there was a terrible storm. A bolt of lightning hit their house and a fire started. When authorities arrived on the scene, they found the parents burnt to death, which was the perfect outcome for despicable people like that. But the boy who had been chained up in the basement at the time was nowhere to be found, aside from his hand, still chained up to the wall in the basement. So where did he go? Well, legends started to spread that over the years he grew up stalking through the woods, stealing from homes nearby, brandishing a hook for a hand and brutalizing innocent people, especially young couples. The urban legend of the Hookman is one you see all over the place. This is just Ohio's specific version of the tale. If you're liking our channel uh, so far, by the way, if you're new here, why not hit that subscribe button? You got nothing to lose. It's free. We got awesome videos coming at you on the daily.
All right, next on the list, we have Munchkinland. This urban legend of uh, Munchkinland, also known as Tiny Town in Cincinnati, Ohio, centers around a peculiar area near Rumkey Landfill. Here, a cluster of small houses and buildings allegedly housed a community of little people. According to local lore, these tiny inhabitants were notorious for hurling rocks at passing cars, attempting to deter any intruders. Numerous tales circulated about unsuspecting individuals who stopped their cars in the vicinity, only to find themselves confronted by enraged little folk armed with rocks and ready to defend their territory. As to where these little people are said to have come from, the legend goes that they were retired circus performers. Now, there actually was a collection of small structures in this area. They've recently been torn down, I believe. But as to why they were there, there are lots of different stories, including, of course, that they were built by the little retired circus performers. A more likely explanation, though, is that they had been built by a farmer on the land who had decided he wanted to start running hayrides and uh, that he you know, built the houses on the property. But I think it's still a bit murky as to how they got there. Number eight, the Peninsula Python. So this incident involved the discovery of a large python in the Cuyahoga Valley National Park in Peninsula, Ohio in the summer of 1944. The question obviously was, how did this python native to tropical regions end up in a park in Ohio? Well, for a while, authorities didn't even think the reports were real. Or at least they didn't think uh, people were really seeing what they thought they were seeing. A massive snake stalking the area became something of an urban legend at the time, but turns out that there indeed was a python, and as to how it got there, some believed that it had been a pet released by its owner, others speculated that it had escaped from a traveling circus or a private exotic animal collection. It's still a bit of a mystery to this day as to how it really got there. The python was never even found. It likely died during the winter, but some say it's uh, still stalking its way out there. At number seven, we have Gore Orphanage. Light of Hope Orphanage was established in 1902. It was run by a religious zealot. One day the building caught fire and the young ones inside all perished in the flames, the cries for help being unheard. The question was, how did the fire start? Well, some say it was an accident. Maybe one of the orphans dropped a lamp, but then there's the legend of Old Man Gore, the cruel, sadistic man who ran the facility. In reality, the man's name was Johann Sprunger, a he ran the orphanage with his wife, Katerina. It was actually a former orphanage they ran that caught on fire. It was true that they were cruel though. Orphans attempted escaping from the institution on a number of occasions. There was also a fire in an elementary school in the nearby town of Collinwood where 176 young people died. So most likely these two real life incidents were combined and kind of formed this urban legend that is Gore Orphanage. Next on the list, we have the disappearance of Brian Schaefer. In 2006, Brian Schaefer, a medical student at Ohio State University, completely vanished. On the night of March 31st, Schaefer went out with friends to the Ugly Tuna Saloon, a bar near the campus in Columbus. Surveillance footage captured him entering the bar, but never showed him actually leaving. When his friends realized he was missing, they figured he'd gone home, but he hadn't. And surveillance footage from the bar showed footage of Brian speaking with two women outside the bar just before 2 a.m. His friends had already left at this point. Then he went back inside and that was it. No trace of him after that. And here's the thing, the bar only had one entrance monitored by surveillance cameras, which didn't record Brian leaving. On top of that, there were no signs of foul play in his apartment. Over the years, there's been lots of speculation as to what happened here, but one theory is that he voluntarily disappeared and is alive, hopefully anyway, living with a new identity. At our number five spot, we have Amy. On Lick Road, just outside of Cincinnati, a terrible incident is said to have taken place. A woman named Amy lost her life at the hands of someone, but the perpetrator was never found. The prevailing theory is that her boyfriend did it, though. As the years passed, tales of Amy's ghost haunting Lick Road began to spread, making the ghost of Amy one of the most prominent urban legends in Ohio. Supposedly, there are a couple ways to experience the ghost of Amy. One legend goes that if you flick your headlights onto the sign as you're turning on to Lick Road at night, you can see the name Amy briefly flash on the sign. Another goes that if you park your car at the cul-de-sac facing the woods, then flash your headlights three times, your windows will start to fog up with the word help 
being written in the condensation. Some nightly visitors have claimed to see the ghostly figure of Amy standing at the edge of the forest. Others claim to hear disembodied footsteps behind them as they make their way across the bridge. Next up, we have Satan's Hollow. In Cincinnati, there is a famous drainage tunnel, a tunnel with a very dark history. Strange and ominous things are said to have happened there. Satanic rituals and disappearances supposedly plague the tunnel. And one story goes that during one of these rituals, a portal to the underworld was accidentally opened. This has led to a number of locals believing this series of uh, interconnected tunnels are actually a portal to hell itself now. People claim to hear strange noises coming from its depths and have even witnessed a shadowy figure known as the Shadow Man, a demonic entity who stalks the tunnel at night. The Werewolf of Defiance. So in the summer of 1972, the small town of Defiance, Ohio was rocked by a series of bizarre and terrifying encounters with what locals would describe as the Werewolf of Defiance. First reported sighting occurred when two railroad workers, Ted Davis and Tom Jones, were laboring on the Norfolk and Western Railway. Ted Davis, busy with his work, suddenly looked up to witness something completely unexplainable, a large wolf-like creature clutching a wooden board in its paws. The creature then just whacked Ted on the shoulder with the board before vanishing into the nearby bushes. I like the imagery of that. Just a werewolf come walking out. Bam! All right, goodbye. Anyway, five days later, Ted and Tom uh, returned to work, hoping that the strange encounter was just a one-time event. But unfortunately, they spotted this pesky werewolf again. Luckily, it was much further away this time, and uh, they just booked it out of there. They reported the incident to the local police, and before long, this wave of similar reports flooded in from various parts of Defiance. More and more residents claimed to have encountered a wolf man-like creature. People were scared to go outside. Like, nobody wants to be gored by a massive-sized wolf person. The sightings, they did trail off, but the Wolf Man of Defiance has remained a legend of Ohio ever since. In its second place, we have the Crosswick Monster. This incident took place in 1982 and has become a prominent tale in Ohio's cryptid folklore. According to this story, two young boys, Ed and Joe Lynch, encountered a terrifying creature in a field. They heard peculiar noises coming from the tall grass, and before they could react, a massive four-legged lizard-like beast emerged. The creature swiftly approached them, grabbing 13-year-old Ed in its jaws, and began dragging him towards a hollowed-out tree. Fortunately, though, the boy's screams caught the attention of three nearby men who rushed in to help. They managed to rescue Ed, but he sustained some pretty severe injuries. In response to this initial attack, a group of 60 men armed themselves with axes and clubs, and I'm imagining torches, and they formed a posse to hunt down this creature. They managed to catch up with it, and at one point it stood up on its hind legs. The chase led them to a hill of rocks where the creature vanished into a hole never to be seen again. The story was written up in the local paper at the time, and it's since grown to be a staple of Ohio's folklore. Just what the hell was the thing that they saw that day. And finally, at our number one spot, we have the Circleville Writer. The Circleville Letters case, which began in 1976 in Circleville, Ohio. Is it Circleville or Circle? Sir Solville, let me know in the comments. Anyway, it's still one of the most perplexing unsolved mysteries in the state. It all began with these anonymous, threatening letters sent to numerous residents. The letters contained detailed personal information about the recipients' lives, leading to this fear and paranoia throughout the community. The mysterious writer knew intimate details about the victims' private lives and warned them to cease certain behaviors. One of the primary recipients, Mary Gillespie, was uh, particularly targeted. The sender claimed she had been having an affair, which Mary insisted was not true, and the situation escalated when Mary's husband, Ron Gillespie, received a letter warning him that he would be unalived. The case took a tragic turn when Ron Gillespie was found dead in his crashed car. His death was ruled an accident, but many suspected foul play. The letters persisted even after Ron's death, leaving the town baffled about the identity of the sender. Several theories emerged, including suspicions about a local school superintendent and, and Mary's brother-in-law, but no conclusive evidence was ever found, leaving the case 
unsolved. This incident has inspired numerous legends and conspiracy theories. Stories have spread about the letters having been written by some sort of uh, vengeful ghost or spirit haunting the town, even. Starting off this countdown, we have Cicada 3301. Now, this is one of the most famous internet mysteries of all time. So, it all started in 2012 when a mysterious organization, Cicada 3301, posted a weird message on 4chan. According to the message, there was a secret hidden within their posted image, and they were recruiting highly intelligent individuals to try and solve it. They said that solving this was would lead them on the road to finding them, and that they looked forward to meeting those that solved it. Well, it turns out that by opening the image file in a text editing app, a string of characters would appear. When decoded, it led users to a website with even more weird messages. Some say that they solved the mystery. Others say that those who completed the puzzle are recruited for something and are never heard from again. What are they recruited for though? That's what I would like to know. In our ninth spot, we have Heaven's Gate. This was a creepy and popular American religious cult on the internet that believed in UFOs. In 1997, police found 39 members of the cult dead inside of a house. Apparently, the members took their lives in order to ascend and board an extraterrestrial spacecraft and go to another planet. They were all found wearing arm patches that read Heaven's Gate Away Team. To this day, the website is still up and running, and no one knows who's running it. Now, in 2015, the administrators behind the website did do an email interview. In the interview, they called themselves TELA, which stands for the evolutionary level above humans. They claim that the dead members are actually alive and have transcended their human bodies and that they will come back eventually. To this day, their identity still remains unknown. In our eighth spot, we have Chip Chan. This is one internet mystery that has always left me unsettled. Chip Chan is the name given to a Korean woman that was discovered in a 4chan webcam thread in 2008. It immediately caught the attention of a number of people because the footage revealed this woman sleeping in unusual positions for long periods of time at unusual times of day. In fact, at first, people thought that she was dead. She also sleeps in weird positions like on a chair or on the floor. After doing further investigation, users found that this woman believes that a mind control weapon was implanted into her ankle bone and under her left eyebrow. This chip is said to control her and that's what's making her sleep all the time. She also claims that she is being held by a corrupt officer named P and that she installed these webcams into her home so that she can see what happens to her when she's sleeping. This story is just so freaking creepy and I don't think it's ever been solved. In our seventh spot today, we have Kanye Quest. Yeah, not Kanye West, Kanye Quest. Kanye Quest 3030 is an RPG game that was released in 2013. Now, it seems just like a silly game. It centers around Kanye West, who on his way to take out trash, travels through a wormhole and into the future. He then has to take down an evil dictator. And you got Tupac, Snoop Dogg, Dr. Dre in it, and you can have a rap battle with them. Now, the game seems pretty harmless. That was until a player found out the game's dark secret. At one point in the game, you can interact with a displayed message. It seems like gibberish at first, until people realized it said, ascend and worship the based god. Further on in the game, you are asked to enter a prompt, and you can type anything you want. But if you type ascend, the whole game changes and you're put in this secret area. Eventually, players got to a screen that congratulated them on being an open-minded and curious thinker. They then instructed the player to not tell anyone about what they found. Out. It then asks if you wish to participate. If you click yes, then they give you instructions on an exercise that you need to complete. Furthermore, players discovered a QR code that led to a now defunct website. In the end, it was discovered that the game has been tied to the religious cult of Ascensionism and to a mysterious company, Ascension Records. The true meaning of the secret of this game has remained unsolved to this day. Coming in at number six, we have Jack Frozy. Now, there are a number of creepy pastas out there about someone dying and then their loved ones receive phone calls or Facebook messages or texts from the dead person. Well, this actually happened in real life. 
Jack Frozy was a 32 year old man from Dunmore, Pennsylvania. In June of 2011, he died suddenly and unexpectedly from a heart arrhythmia. Five months after Jack's death, his friend received an email from Jack's account with the subject line, I'm watching. Soon his family started getting emails from Jack as well. Now, of course, they didn't believe it to be Jack for a second, but whoever it was, they knew intimate details regarding his friends and family, details only Jack would know. To this day, no one knows who sent these emails. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with GhostNet. This is the name given to a large scale cyber spying operation uncovered in 2009. In fact, it has been described as one of the most extensive operations ever uncovered. Yet, no one knows who was behind this operation. So in 2009, it was found that an organization infiltrated over 1,000 computers across 103 countries. They did this by sending emails with attachments or links to individuals or organizations. By opening the file, the user would unknowingly download a virus onto their computer that allowed the hackers to gain complete control of their computers so they could read and send data and even turn on someone's webcam and microphone. Like I said, no one knows who was behind this. But since the network originated in China, some believe that the Chinese government had something to do with this. Others believe that the CIA or the Russian government were behind this. In our fourth spot, we have the most mysterious song on the internet. This is the title given to a song with an unknown name, sung by an unknown artist with an unknown origin. It all started when a man named Darius came across an old cassette and liked a song on there and wanted to find the name of it. Him and his sister couldn't figure it out, so they turned to the internet for help. Soon, thousands of music enthusiasts came forward to try and figure out this song. To this day, no one has figured out who's behind this song, hence why it's given the name the most mysterious song on the internet. What's even weirder is when the song was shared online, a number of people recognized it. They said that they have heard it before, they just can't put their finger on it. In our third spot, we have Markovian Parallax Denigrate. This mystery started back in the 90s and revolves around a number of weird and confusing posts that appeared to be complete gibberish. Back then, there was something called Usenet, which was like a forum. On August 5th of 1996, hundreds of weird messages started appearing on Usenet. No one knew what they meant, but people knew that they were related because each post had one thing in common. The subject line read Markovian Parallax Denigrate. Turns out that these are secret codes, but no one has been able to crack them yet. In our second spot, we have Ted the Caver. Now, some say this is merely just a creepy pasta, whereas others believe it's a true story. I'll let you decide what you want to think. Back in February of 2000, a man known only by the name of Ted the Caver posted about exploring an unknown virgin cave passage in the US. According to Ted and his journal entries, when him and his friend entered the cave, they found a narrow passageway with a small hole. So they drilled the hole and decided to explore it further. But as they went to explore this cave, weird things began to happen. Him and his friend heard ghastly screaming, they found weird hieroglyphs on the cave walls, and apparently encountered evil spirits in the cave that followed them home. All of this was backed up with images of him and his friend exploring the cave. The last post was on May 19th, 2001, when Ted revisited the cave and said he would update everyone when he returned home. He never updated the post, making people believe that he never returned home. In fact, this mystery was so popular that a horror movie was made off of it. And in our number one spot today, we have the Lake City Quiet Pills. Now, this is another very weird and wild one. So it starts with the death of a Reddit user, Religion of Peace. He was a moderator for the subreddit Jailbait, which is disturbing on its own. But he mainly posted about his military experience and guns and would encourage posts to get people to upload pictures on his website, lakecityquietpills.com. But as many investigated his site, they realized that hidden inside the site's HTML code was a motto. It said, and I quote, dispensing Lake City quiet pills to lousy bastards in need of permanent rest since 1968. It continued on saying, Shade is maintaining the calendar and access to the file dump. Angel has the job postings for EU and Asia. We aren't sending anyone to me, no one. Don't ask for listings. Then what followed were what appeared to be job listings. Here are some. Immediate need, eight to 10 Chinese Korean, fluent Korean dialect accent, 
details after contact. 12 week, half pay. And they went on to say that they needed Arabic French people. No papers, no problems. A lot of people then theorized that this site was used as a way to pass assassination jobs back and forth. As people dug further, they found a government owned bullet factory in Missouri called Lake City Ammunition Plant. Meaning, the quiet pills that they're referring to are bullets. I mean, yeah, you get shot by one of those and you'll be quiet. So maybe this website was a front for some illegal activity. Starting off this countdown, we have A858. In 2011, a Reddit user posted a strange and indecipherable code to the subreddit RA858DE45F5169BC9. Very long, so people refer to it as A858 for short. On the subreddit, this user would post puzzles and cryptic messages. It gained a lot of traction and people were desperately trying to crack these puzzles. No one has been successful to this day. Things got strange when the original poster disappeared for four years. When they came back in 2015, that's when he began dropping subtle hints, including a message that when decoded, it revealed an image of Stonehenge. Sadly, in 2016, the page became private, and I believe that it still is private. In our ninth spot, we have Publius Enigma. This is an unsolved puzzle or riddle that was posted on the internet by a user named Publius. Basically, they said that there was a message hidden in the 1994 Pink Floyd album, Division Bell. Many people have tried to solve this puzzle, but none have been successful. It was said though that whoever solved the riddle would be given a reward. Now, the band denied any association with this riddle, and if that's the case, who's behind it? How do you solve it? And what is the reward? In our 8th spot, we have Gary McKinnon. In 2002, Gary McKinnon was determined to figure out if aliens were real. He spent hours researching them and trying to figure out what NASA was hiding. That's when he decided to hack into NASA to see what he could find. In the end, he discovered an image of some sort of strange flying aircraft in the sky. When NASA noticed that an outsider had obtained this information, his access was shut off. Of course, NASA has always denied Gary's claims on the UFO photos that he saw. In the end, Gary was let off the hook, but to this day, we don't know if what he saw was real, or if he made it up, or what. In our seventh spot, we have Unfavorable Semicircle. This is said to be YouTube's strangest mystery. It started in March of 2015, when a YouTube account with the title Unfavorable Semicircle was created. From there, they started to post weird cryptic videos all titled with the Sagittarius symbol and then random numbers. The videos were often of abstract pixelated images. Some videos were accompanied with weird and distorted sounds. In fact, in some of the videos you can hear a muffled male voice breathing or reciting random letters or numbers. This channel posted thousands of these weird cryptic videos. To this day, nobody knows what the videos mean or who's behind them. Now here's where it gets weird. A bunch of Reddit users became determined to solve this mystery. From there, the channel gained a lot of attention. But as soon as this happened, YouTube suspended the account without explanation. The videos are basically lost forever. All that's left are bad screen recordings of them. Moving on to number six, we have the Plague Doctor video. This is another very famous video on YouTube. The video features a person dressed in a Plague Doctor mask, doing a bunch of weird stuff in a rundown building. Now, the video title was in binary code. When translated, it spelt out death in Spanish. How creepy is that? Not only that, but the video is filled with an awful buzzing sound. And apparently, if you put this buzzing sound into a spectrogram, which basically gives you a visual representation of the sound, it apparently makes the shape of a woman who's being harmed. To this day, no one knows what's up with this video, or who's behind it, or what it means. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with our creepy. Now this is another part to that creepy plague doctor video. So when that video became viral, the subreddit our creepy became devoted to solving this mystery. However, along the way, some mysterious people started posting weird messages in the forum. One was a Morse code message that when translated said, red lips, life tenth. Don't know what that means at all. And then they also posted, 2015, there will be three. Again, no one knows what this means. Other messages included a list of chess moves, the coordinates to the White House, and coded disturbing images depicting violence against women. To this day, no one has been able to solve this mystery or find out who's behind all these posts. 
In our fourth spot, we have the deep web. The term deep web refers to the 80% of the internet that is inaccessible through normal internet browsers. And there's a reason why. The stuff on the deep web can be traumatizing. One person stumbled upon an online bid. When the bidding ended, it was revealed that they were bidding on a woman who was tied to a chair. The winning bidder could type what they wanted to do to her. Turns out that this was a torture murder live stream. Moving on to number three, we have Mariana Mortegard Glesgorf. Excuse me, I know I just butchered that name. But this is apparently one of the scariest and most haunted videos on the internet. This video was posted on YouTube in 2008 and immediately unsettled everyone who watched it. It starts off with some man just staring into the camera, then out of nowhere, he starts laughing maniacally. In the next section of the video, we see a man with weird, creepy eyeballs. Now, the full video is two minutes long. However, you are warned never to watch the full video. It is said that if you do, it'll drive you insane. In fact, the entire video was apparently removed off of YouTube after 100 people took out their own eyeballs after watching this video and then mailed them to YouTube's main office in San Bruno. To this day, we don't know who created this video, why, and who's that man in the video. In our second spot, we have the killer. A number of killers have apparently used forum sites like 4chan to ask some pretty disturbing questions and tease others. On 4chan, one person discovered a post where someone asked what they keep in their freezer. This person replied with a picture of dead body parts in their freezer. Another killer decided to play a little game with some people on 4chan. He said that there was a missing person, and if they guessed who it was correctly, then they would give them a freebie and then coordinates to where her body was buried. And I don't know if she was ever found. And in our number one spot today, we have how to be a serial killer. Now, this is the name of a website, thankfully no longer active, that used to teach people how to become a serial killer. The site was full with detailed explanations on how to kill people and get away with it. Eventually, the site was removed, but when you searched for it, a message popped up saying, how to be a serial killer has been removed. If you're really interested in killing someone, why don't you start with yourself? Oh, uh, excuse me? No, okay, sorry. Uh, we still need to know who created this site and why. Coming in at number nine, we have Mr. Bear. This next story is so bizarre and some even believe that it's true. Apparently in 1999 in Caledon, Ontario, they had a local TV channel called Caledon Local 21. Now on this channel, they had a children's show called Mr. Bear. Now we wish that this show was about cute friendly bears like Care Bears, but it definitely wasn't. Now, this show featured a man dressed in a bear suit. Each episode, he would welcome their guest, always a child. He would bring the child into the cellar and play games with them. It is said that he used the show to lure children to him. Some people claim to remember the show. Other people have gone as far as to creating some episodes in a parody type fashion. I just find this very disturbing. For number eight, we have Charlie Charlie. Have any of you heard the saying, Charlie, Charlie, are you there? Well, it's part of a game designed to apparently contact the ghost Charlie. Charlie was a young boy who tragically passed away. Some people say he passed away in a car accident. Others say he took his own life. And he has now come back to haunt whoever contacts him. Players that play this game are supposed to place two pencils overlapping each other to form a cross. The pencils are placed on top of a piece of paper that have two sections, yes and no. After they summon Charlie, apparently they can communicate to him through this contraption using only yes or no questions. Charlie's end goal is to terrorize and harm any one who plays this game. I wouldn't define it as a game because it's not fun, it's just scary and dumb, don't play it. Coming in at number six, we have Momo. In 2019, a viral picture spread around the internet. I'm sorry for the image that you're about to see because it gives me the creeps looking at it. This photo features a girl with huge bulging eyes, straight greasy hair, and a thin large mouth. Apparently this girl's name is Momo and she is a demon or ghost that's goal is to get people to harm themselves. Now a virtual game type challenge started going around on apps such as WhatsApp or even 
Snapchat, where apparently Momo would command people to do tasks that would lead them to commit acts of extreme violence. Other people said that Momo would appear in kids shows like Peppa Pig or in popular games like Fortnite to try and attract kids. Don't worry, this is a hoax. I did tons of research because I was so scared I wanted to make sure that it was indeed fake. So. You're welcome. So the picture of Momo is actually a sculpture made by the Japanese artist Kasuki Asawa. He titled this piece of art Mother Bird. When people saw the photo, that's when they started creating a story surrounding it. In our fourth spot, we have Bloody Mary. Now, I'm not talking about the cocktail here. I wish I was. I feel like most people have heard of this story. It was really popular when I was a kid. In fact, I was stupid enough to try it with my friends and thank gosh, nothing happened. So this legend surrounds a ghost named Bloody Mary. It spooks me just even saying her name. <laughs> now it is said that if you enter the bathroom, turn off the lights and look in the mirror and chant her name three times, nice try, I'm not gonna say it for the video, then she will appear in the mirror and potentially scratch you. Now there are a lot of variations of the story. Some say you must be holding a lit candle, others say you need to spin around three times while saying her name, or even by saying Bloody Mary, I believe in you. I swear guys, if I get haunted for just talking about these stories, I'm not gonna be happy. This is the one story that I kind of believe just because my friends have done it and have witnessed paranormal stuff. But who knows? All I know is that I will never do it. Coming in at number three, we have the girl in the photograph. Word from the wise, if you find a random photograph on the ground, don't go picking it up. Let me explain why. This legend revolves around a beautiful girl that changes her appearance based on her victim. Basically, whoever finds the photograph of her will become infatuated with her. She uses her beauty to brainwash her victims and then leads them to their death. In the photo, this girl also changes depending on how many people she killed. For example, if she killed three people, she will eerily be shown holding up, you guessed it, three fingers. In our second spot, we have I Feel Fantastic. In 2004, a video titled I Feel Fantastic was uploaded to YouTube. This video features a very, very, very scary mannequin type thing named Tara. Tara can be seen with her body completely still, but just her head and lips moving to the song that plays in the background. Now, Tara is not the best singer, and it sounds like a voice simulator type thing with high pitched beats in the background. The song alone is very agitating to listen to. The robot lady thing was created by John Bergeron, who programmed her to sing the song he writes. Some of the lyrics include, please leave and run, run, run. The shots of Tara are intercut with her in different outfits and outdoor shots. Now, people believe that the creator of Tara has committed murder and that Tara is wearing the victim's clothes. They also believe that the outside random shots that don't seem to tie into the video actually show where the victim's bodies are buried. The creator also left a cryptic message in the video's description. He makes a reference to Pygmalion. Pygmalion was a Greek god who thought women were tainted and unworthy of love. He then decided to build his ideal woman and fell in love with her. People believe Tara was once the woman he loved and when he found out she had too many flaws, he murdered her and created this robot thing to replace her. And in our number one spot, we have the blind maiden. This story gives me the heebie-jeebies, like zoinks. This legend surrounds a website known as blindmaiden.com. I suggest not going on that website, please for your own good. Apparently, it is said that you have no access to this website unless you enter at exactly 12 o'clock a.m. while being alone in a room with the lights off. If you succeed to meet this criteria, then you will be allowed to access the site. Now, on this site, it is said that you will encounter disturbing images of boys and girls without eyes and with distorted faces. It is said that you have to be careful not to click anything by accident or else you will face the consequences. On this website, you will have two options, accept or decline. If you accept, then the monitor will change and display someone approaching your house. Then the video footage will change again and you will see a live footage of your back as you feel someone behind you. If you turn around, the maiden will rip your eyes out and take your picture. You will then be a part of the numerous other photos of eyeless individuals on the website. My question is, is what if you just don't turn around and face her? Like she's there, you can feel her there, you just don't turn around. She'll 
Now, if you choose decline, then you are safe from the maiden. And we're starting off this list with Natalie Wood. Natalie Wood was an actress who started out her career as a child, acting in her first film in 1943, but she would continue filming movies into her early 40s, acting in sometimes as much as three movies a year. She's probably most famous for playing Maria in West Side Story. The last movie she starred in, along with Christopher Walken, was Brainstorm. Filming took place in 1980. And before the film was even finished, she would die under mysterious circumstances. Wood, along with her husband Robert Wagner, co star Christopher Walken, and Dennis Davern, who was the captain of the boat, went on a weekend boat trip to Santa Catalina Island on the evening of November 28th. The following morning, Natalie's body was discovered a mile away from the boat. Close by was an inflatable dinghy. It's never been officially determined what happened the previous night. Davern claimed that there had been an intense argument between Wagner and Natalie that night over her relationship with Christopher Walken. There were also bruises found on her body and two people who had been on a nearby boat claimed they had heard screams that night. Ultimately though, Natalie Wood's death was ruled an accidental drowning. Next we have Thelma Todd. Thelma Todd was an actress who acted in over a hundred films between 1926 and 1935. You'll probably remember her best for her role as Amelia Frisbee in the 1934 comedy smash hit Hips Hips Hooray. No? Alright, well, you gotta get up to speed on your on your film knowledge. I guess. In 1935, Todd was found slumped over the wheel of her car, which was parked in her friend's garage. Jewel Carmen, who was a former wife of Thelma's partner at the time, Roland West. Her death was determined to have been caused by carbon monoxide poisoning. The engine wasn't running though, and there looked to be signs of trauma to her neck, like someone had shoved a hose into it or something. To this day, it's never been determined what exactly happened. Roland West was a suspect for a while, along with Thelma's former husband and a gangster named Lucky Luciano, but there was not enough evidence to ever convict anyone. So in the end, this was determined to be simply an accident. Number 8, Brittany Murphy. A lot of you probably know who Brittany Murphy is. She appeared in tons of movies and shows throughout the 90s and 2000s. Clueless, 8 Mile, she was in Sin City, a huge star back in the day. In 2009, in her Los Angeles home, Murphy collapsed in the bathroom. Her husband, Simon Monjack, called 911, and she was transported to Cedars Sinai Medical Center, where she was pronounced dead after going into cardiac arrest. It was determined that her death had been caused by pneumonia and anemia, along with a concoction of like over the counter cold and prescription medications that were floating through her system. Now, what's odd about this case is that her husband not only initially refused an autopsy on her to find out what exactly caused her death, but he would also die about five months later of eerily similar causes pneumonia and anemia, along with tons of over the counter drugs in his system. Some believe that Murphy could have been poisoned, but the case has never been reopened. Joe Pitchler. Joe Pitchler was a child actor, appearing mostly in kids' movies in the late 90s and early 2000s. If you grew up watching the Beethoven movies uh, with, with the dog, he was the uh, he was in the third and fourth sequels. He left acting in high school and was planning to return to it upon graduation, but he went missing at 18 years old, last seen on January 5th, 2006, where he had gone to a party with friends. Pitchler's Toyota Corolla was found four days after he went missing. There was a no inside the car where Pitchler had expressed his wishes to quote be a better brother and for his personal effects to be given to said younger brother. His cell phone was also found. His last outgoing call was at 4 a.m. to one of his friends who he had been at the party with him. Police figured that Pitchler had taken his own life, although no body has ever been discovered, and the family was rather upset, saying not enough action was being taken in the investigation. Police never dusted his car for fingerprints, and apparently they didn't take much time looking through his apartment either, so. He's just been missing ever since. Next up, we have the original Superman. Not Christopher Reeve, George Reeves. George Reeves played Superman in the live action Adventures of Superman series from 1952 to 1958. On June 16th, 1959, Reeves died of a 
gunshot wound in the upstairs bedroom of his home. At the time a party was being held in the home, his death was thought to be self-inflicted. There were signs he wasn't doing well mentally as his career was kind of in a bad way. But there's always been some mystery surrounding this case. There were conflicting stories about where Reeves fiance at the time, Lenora Lemon was. Some say she was downstairs when guests heard a loud bang coming from upstairs, while others report her coming downstairs after the shot rang out, saying, tell them I was here, tell them I was down here. Till this day, there's, it's never been determined whether Reeves took his own life or if someone else did, either on purpose or accidentally. Number five, Marilyn Monroe. On August 5th, 1962, the renowned Hollywood icon was found lifeless in her Brentwood home at the age of 36. The official cause of death was declared as a drug overdose, but the circumstances surrounding the incident have generated conspiracy theories for years. Some believe that Monroe's death was not an accident, but an intentional act, that possibly someone wanted to silence her due to her alleged involvement with some pretty powerful people. She was rumored to have had an affair with John F. Kennedy and was involved with other prominent politicians. Others think she may have actually just taken her own life, but until this day, her death is still a mystery. Next up we have Bob Crane. Now, Bob Crane is most famous for starring as Hogan in the 60s sitcom Hogan's Heroes. He acted all the way up until his mysterious death in 1978. And there was definitely foul play involved, but the exact circumstances surrounding his death have never been determined. Crane had an interesting hobby. Uh, he enjoyed photographing and filming his adult nightly activities with various women, along with his friend John Henry Carpenter, a sales manager for Sony Electronics. Electronics, who I, I guess did all the cinematography. I've uh, never seen any of these films. So I'm not going to seek them out. On the afternoon of June 29th, 1978, Crane's co-star in a play he was acting in, Victoria Ann Barry, entered his apartment after he had failed to show up for a meeting. His lifeless body was then discovered. He had an electrical cord tied around his neck and had severe trauma to his head. Police thought he was likely hit over the head with a camera tripod, but no one ever found that and no weapon was ever found either. The prime suspect was his friend John Carpenter, but there was never enough evidence to convict him, so exactly what happened will likely always remain a mystery. Number three, Kurt Cobain. Now these next three have been ex speculated on extensively. Kurt Cobain really needs no introduction, and if he does, uh, then you're, you're too young to be watching this video. Go listen to some Nirvana. On April 8th, 1994, Cobain's body was discovered with a supposed self-inflicted shot wound. Authorities believed he had been deceased for about three days when he was found. Cobain had also left a note saying he was no longer interested in writing or creating music. Now there were signs that Cobain was struggling with being in the spotlight. He was known to have issues with his mental health and it was determined that he had likely taken his own life. But there have always been conspiracy theories and suspicions surrounding Cobain's wife, Courtney Love, that she could have been responsible for his death. Now, I mean, there's t you can watch tons of videos of people going through these kinds of theories. I think it's just hard for people to accept sometimes that artists whose work they've fallen in love with and meant so much to them may not have had as much genuine happiness in their lives as you'd hope. Sometimes I think it's just easier to wrap your head around foul play. It just gives you someone to blame. Tupac Shakur. Once again, I don't think you really need me to tell you who Tupac is. Uh, this was another very big and well-known case that is still hotly discussed to this very day. On September 7th, 1996 in Las Vegas, after attending a Mike Tyson match, Tupac was on his way to Suge Knight's Club 662. While sitting at a stoplight, a white Cadillac sedan pulled up beside him and fired into the car. Shakur suffered multiple gunshot wounds with two striking him in the chest. He was rushed to the hospital, fought for his life for about six days, but he succumbed to his wounds on September 13th. And ever since that night, the question of who fired has been on everyone's mind. Was it a gang member? Was it a rival rapper? Tupac had survived the shooting two years earlier that he believed Biggie and Puff Daddy could have set up somehow. And just six months later, Notorious B.I.G. also died in a drive-by. Whoever these shooters were, they have never been found. Finally, we have Bruce Lee. Uh, so an absolute legend, everyone knows who Bruce Lee is, but if you are a martial arts or action movie fan and you've never taken the time to watch one of his movies, 
please do. This man is a legend for a very good reason. Now, Bruce was in peak physical condition when he died in 1973 at 32 years of age. He had met with a producer named Raymond Chow, along with actress Betty Ting Pai, to go over the script for Game of Death. Later in the evening, Lee had a severe headache, and Ting gave him a painkiller called a Quadrasec. Lee went to take a nap, but he never woke up. He was rushed to the hospital where he was pronounced dead. It was determined that Lee had suffered a fatal cerebral edema. His brain had swollen up. He had collapsed two months earlier while recording replacement dialogue for Enter the Dragon, where a cerebral edema was also found to be the cause. But as to what actually caused this swelling, we're still not 100% sure. And after his death, several hypotheses began floating around. There's a theory that Bruce Lee had a curse placed on him. Another uh, theory is that the triads could have had something to do with it. Lee had just finished making his biggest movie to date, uh, this time in Hollywood with Enter the Dragon, which some think could have ticked off the Chinese Mafia, and in 1994, Lee's son Brandon Lee, of course, also died prematurely on the set of his biggest movie, The Crow. All right. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Henry Baltimore Jr. In 1973, Henry was a 21-year-old honor student at the University of Michigan who had a very promising future ahead of him. In March of that year, Henry was unfortunately attacked inside of his apartment. Two men broke in and tied him to the bed before stealing both money and material items. Henry was reluctant to report this incident to the police, but did end up doing so. After this, a suspect named Roy Davis was arrested and charged with armed robbery, and Henry was scheduled scheduled to testify at his hearing, but never showed up. Two days after the hearing, Henry did resurface and asked the prosecutors to drop the charges because he was frightened, but they refused and Henry was rescheduled to testify. Two days before this rescheduled hearing, Henry ended up disappearing very suspiciously. Originally, people believed that he may have gone into hiding considering how vocal he was about being frightened, but that belief quickly went away and people began to suspect something a lot more sinister was at play. Henry's family especially knew something was wrong because there was no way that he would disappear without telling at least one of them. Without Henry and his testimony, Roy ended up taking a plea deal and only was sentenced to six weeks. Roy was, of course, considered a person of interest in Henry's disappearance, and a neighbor of Henry's even said that they saw Roy and another man knocking on Henry's door the day he disappeared, but Roy's mother offered her son an alibi. Roy has never been formally charged for the disappearance. The two theories of what happened to Henry are either that someone abducted and took the life of Henry to prevent him from testing Justifying, or Henry left Michigan, changed his identity, and assumed a new name. You would have hoped if it was the latter, he would have at least told one of his family members. His case remains open almost 50 years later, and who knows? If someone out there who's watching this video knows something about this case, please call in and give any and all information over to the authorities. The remaining family members of Henry deserve to know what happened to this extremely bright young man. In our number nine spot today, we have Cody James and Gary Harker. Cody James and Gary Harker were longtime friends who were working together on on Christmas Day in 1979 in Moline, Illinois. They left Cody's shop to head out in the truck to deliver an air compressor to Rock Island, Illinois, and then head to pick up a $500 payment for it in Davenport, Iowa, which they never made it to. The black truck they were driving was found almost two months after they had gone missing and subsequently was put up for auction after not being claimed for 40 days. The bodies of Cody and Gary were found in the truck bed by the men who ended up purchasing it. 25 years after their deaths, the case was still unsolved solved, and a friend of Cody and Gary brought police a roll of film that they had been entrusted to by the men. When Cody and Gary gave their friend this film all those years earlier, they said, quote, if anything happens to us, develop this film. It is crazy to think that this friend waited 25 years to spill this tea, and that perhaps the men knew what was going to happen to them. Unfortunately, the film didn't end up giving police any solid leads, although the case continues to be investigated. In our number 8 spot today, we have Christopher Christopher Wallace, also known as the Notorious B.I.G. Christopher Wallace is much better known by his alias, and he was one of the most famous rappers of the 1990s. And even though he was just getting his start, he is considered one of the best rappers of all time. Biggie was a New York rapper, but he was unfortunately killed in March of 1997 after a drive-by shooting while he was in Los Angeles. In 1996, the tensions between the East and West Coast hip-hop and rap scenes were rising, and after the death of Tupac in Las Vegas, rumors began to 
swirl about Biggie and his possible involvement in that killing. Unfortunately, the people who killed Biggie have never been found, and that is where the mystery comes in. There are a lot of similarities between the killings of Big and Tupac, and since neither of them are solved, there are so many rumors about what exactly happened. Some theories span from a gang member with financial motives to a planned hit by a record company in order to boost sales. There is so much speculation and so many possibilities surrounding this, and I really hope that one day we find out who committed this unbelievable crime. Notorious B.I.G. was only able to release one album before his death, but had three albums released posthumously, with the first one achieving a diamond certification in the US. In our number 7 spot today we have Elizabeth Short or The Black Dahlia. This is one of the most famous cold cases ever, and that is because it is horrifying, extremely dark, and super mysterious. Elizabeth Short was an aspiring actor, but her life was cut tragically short by an incredibly inhumane act. Elizabeth's body was found when she was only 22 years old in a vacant lot near a park in Los Angeles in January of 1947. The crime was highly publicized because of how graphic it was, but whoever did this was sure to leave little to no evidence behind. A few days after the crime, someone claiming to be the person who committed this crime called to say that he would eventually turn himself in, but wanted police to search for a while. But he also said he would send in some of Beth Short's belongings. He did follow through on this and did send in things, such as her birth certificate, but this didn't end up giving investigators any leads. During the initial investigation, 60 different men confessed to this crime, and since then there have now been over 500 confessions, which is absolutely insane. There are honestly too many theories on this one to even get into right now, and it is quite possible that we may never know what exactly happened to Elizabeth. In our number 6 spot today we have Jill Dando. Jill was an English journalist and a television presenter until she was killed outside of her southwest London home in 1999. This created the biggest manhunt the country had ever seen since the Yorkshire Ripper in the 70s. A man named Barry George was originally convicted and sentenced to prison for this terrible crime, but he ended up actually being acquitted years later, which now leaves this case unsolved. Jill's next door neighbor heard a surprised gasp from Jill, but he never heard like a shot, and it sounded more like someone who was greeting an old friend. The same neighbor looked out the window and actually saw whoever the killer is, but of course at the time they didn't know who he was or what had just happened, and he also didn't recognize the man, so unfortunately he was unable to give an identification. There are a ton of speculations and rumors about who took Jill's life, and it ranges from a potential stalker to maybe even like a crazy hit job. Hopefully one day there will be answers on why someone would have done something so horrible to Jill. In our number 5 spot today we have Patricia Meehan. This is a story that really just gives me the chills because the circumstances surrounding it are exceptionally strange. On April 20th, 1989, Patricia Bernadette Meehan was in a car accident on Highway 200 near Circle, Montana. Witnesses saw her driving her car on the wrong side of the road, which then led to her crashing into off-duty police dispatcher Carol Heights. Carol was luckily uninjured in the crash, and she got out of her vehicle right away. Upon exiting her vehicle, Carol saw Patricia also exit her vehicle, walk up to her, and just stare at her, without saying a word. Patricia then walked away, climbed over a fence, and then stood staring at the accident before walking away and disappearing, which like literally just talking about it gives me goosebumps. It is so strange. A search began immediately but turned up little results. There have been thousands of reported sightings of Patricia that have potentially given police leads to her whereabouts, but she still has never been found. In our number 4 spot today we have the Mary Celeste. The Mary Celeste first set sail on November 17, 1872 with a cargo full of alcohol. Whatever happened over the next month isn't quite clear, but what we do know is that on the afternoon of December 5th of the same year, another ship on the Atlantic crossing found her drifting somewhere between Azores and Portugal. The captain of this ship knew the captain of the Mary Celeste and knew that he was a skilled and capable sailor, so he was extremely suspicious. He ordered a crew to board the Mary Celeste, and when they did, they found that the ship had been deserted, but it was in full seaworthy condition, so why had they abandoned it? Especially the captain. The captain of the ship that found the derelict split his crew and sailed the Mary Celeste to Gibraltar for more investigations, but despite this, the captain, his family, and the crew of seven that were on board the Mary Celeste simply just disappeared, and no one knows what happened or where they could have gone. I think this one is so famous because it seemingly just has no answers tied to it at all. Like, it really is just one of those mysteries with next to nothing to go off in terms of any sort of clues. In our number 3 spot today we have the Yuba County 5. 
On February 24, 1978, five men from Yuba City, California attended a basketball game at California State University. All five men went missing after this night, and several days later, the group's car was found abandoned in a remote area of the Plumas National Forest that was way way, way out of the way from where they should have been. There was no reason for the car to have been abandoned because it was in totally fine working condition when it was found. In June of 1978, four of the men were found passed away near a trailer camp that is deep in the forest, but the fifth man has never been found. There is a lot of strange information about this case, such as how one of the men starved to death even though he was surrounded by food. There is truly too much to cover about this story that I unfortunately don't have time for, but if you're interested, I would highly I highly recommend looking it up because this case is truly unexplainable and absolutely terrifying. In our number two spot today, we have Jim Gray. Jim Gray was an incredibly important computer scientist who was responsible for many computer advancements that changed things for all of us. Other than being a computer scientist, he was also a really experienced and skilled sailor. And one day, on January 28th, 2007, he set sail for a short trip so he could head out and spread his mother's ashes as she had recently passed away. As his trip began, Jim spoke to his wife on the phone and said he would give her a call once he got back in range. After their phone call, he called his daughter as well and left a little message for her and that was when he was off on his trip, but unfortunately he never ended up returning. Jim's wife Donna was the one who raised the alarm bells as she was away on a trip, but like I mentioned, Jim said he would call her later and he never did. At this point is when huge searches began. Thousands of images of the area where Jim or his boat might be were uploaded to the Amazon Mechanical Turk for people to look through and see if they could find any kind of signs, but to no avail. Jim also had an automatic emergency position indicating beacon on his ship, but whatever happened to Jim and the ship clearly didn't meet the requirements, or perhaps it had some sort of malfunction, or maybe it was even turned off. To this day, no one knows what happened to Jim or his boat, as no sign or trace of either has ever been found. The theories of what may have happened are endless, and range from Jim intentionally disappearing, to him being kidnapped for his computer skills and brain in order to do some kind of inside job and everything in between. There most definitely are theories that are seemingly more likely than others, but at the end of the day, they are all a possibility. In our number one spot today, we have Moro de Moro. Moro was an Italian investigative journalist, and it is said that his profession is most likely what led to his disappearance. On the evening of September 16th, 1970, he was coming back home from work, but never actually returned. Before his disappearance, he apparently was convinced that he had the story of a lifetime, and he even had told his co-workers that he had a story that was going to shake Italy. There are three main speculations and theories about what this story might have been and what could have happened. One theory is that the story could have been related to the death of a man named Enrico, who is the president of Italy's state-owned oil and gas conglomerate, ENI. The next was that his story could have been about finding a drug trafficking network between Sicily and the United States. And the final theory is that his disappearance might have been related to a failed right-wing coup that took place in the 70s. Despite extensive searches, he has never been found. And in fact, two of the main detectives who started this case both had their lives taken by the mafia. It is believed that Mora was a victim of what is called Lupara Bianca, which is a journalistic term for when the mafia takes the life of someone in such a way that their body will never be found. Whatever story he was working on, we'll likely never know, and it's such a tragedy that a job he was so passionate about is most likely what led to his disappearance. Mm -hmm.